Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. So we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Amanda Rosenzweig, and I am the department chair of biology. And SLT has two concentrations, biotechnology and chemical technology. And biotechnology falls under the biology department. I'm just going to do a brief introduction today. And I do want to thank you for coming. Our students, some of them have um, been faced with some hardships due to the tornadoes last night. So it is going to affect attendance, but this is being recorded and streamed live. So they will get the information um, some way or another um, based on when they are able to come back to campus. Just wanna give a quick welcome. This QR code will allow you to go directly to our SLT site. And then you can look up different curriculum on chemical technology and biotechnology, as well as some of the events and different experiences offered. And last, just gonna go over a few housekeeping rules. So we are recording. This is being um, streamed live. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, if you are not speaking, we ask that you remain on mute. And if you have any questions, you can place them in the chat or raise your hand. I will be um, monitoring the chat throughout the session today. If you have any questions or you want to share pictures or make any statements on social media, please tag us with hashtag DCCSLT. And then we are on many different social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. It is being live, um, streamed live on Facebook right now. And these are the different contact information for different members of our program. Now, without any further ado, I wanna introduce you to the biotechnology director, Ms. Charlene Shunick. And at this time, I think Dr. Noble is in class. So if she hops on before we move to our first presenter, I will introduce you to her also. Hey everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Charlene, Charlie Shunick, everyone calls me Charlie, and I'm the biotechnology director within the SLT program. Um, my biggest role is making sure that our students are happy and comfortable communicating with many of our partners and other support systems around the nation and of course in the city and um, you know seeing what other things we need to develop to make sure our students are getting the best opportunities for their future careers and pathways. Now that the pandemic, I'm not going to say it's over because I don't think it will be, but we're adjusting to the fact that COVID-19 is part of our lives. Things are really starting to pick up and open back up with opportunities. So we're starting to see some of that um, upward momentum coming back toward the lab technology in New Orleans. And it's a developing and, and busting field in the area. So we're really seeing a lot more biotechnology and chemical technology opportunities and options. And we're really excited about that. And we really feel like this industry open house is always a great opportunity for students to find out where people came from all the different um, degrees we have and different jobs and skill sets we pick up over the years and how we end up where we are now. And it's really beautiful that we have so many of our support system here today that's gonna talk about all the different things that they are involved in. 
So we really wanna thank our students and everyone that's um, presenting today for continuing to support us, especially since it's been such a challenging and difficult time. Um, with COVID-19, not to mention all the weather events that New Orleans, has, New Orleans has faced in the last year with Hurricane Ida and now this tornado yesterday. Um, for those of y'all that aren't familiar with the SLT program, because I know we're gonna get some students that have sort of heard of it, maybe they're still not sure. We do have two different concentrations. And generally speaking, when students decide to join our program, they're gonna start off as pre-SLT, where they're gonna be taking a lot of courses that are required for other programs, um, like you know uh, algebra and general chemistry lecture and lab, general biology lecture and lab, and then the English 101. As students get more and more interested, they're gonna start taking the intro courses. So we have intro to SLT, there's a lecture and laboratory, both of those courses fall under SCI 130, 132, and they are gonna be required courses before you're allowed to move into the program and really start taking higher level laboratories. Our program's designed so that you start off with soft skills and we continue to build on those skill sets as you get introduced to more and more techniques, different types of um, equipment and technologies that exist. And because we've been able to partner with different um, colleges and universities in the area, sometimes you even get to explore different equipment that we don't have on campus. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergies. Traditionally, we did have students sort of select which concentration or pathway they wanted to choose early on, but now our students are able to take courses in biotech and chemtech and really uh, see what they need in order to achieve their goals. So we do have some biotech students that are doing chemical technology courses and some chemtech students that are doing biotechnology courses as well. Um, and at the end of this program, what students end up doing is an internship that's a 45 um, hour commitment. <clears throat> Many of our students end up working longer than that. And of course they've gotten job opportunities and other opportunities from that, not to mention going into other programs. So it's been really exciting. And even through the pandemic, our students have been doing their internships and graduating, which is very exciting because lab uh, technology is so hands-on and skill heavy. Um, one of the other things that we're working on as a program right now is certificate training. And we're very excited about that. We think it will be happening within the next academic year where our students that are graduating or some of their colleagues and such that need more training with certain skills or equipment are gonna be able to come and do some certificate training alongside some of our students. So that's gonna be some really great opportunities for people in our community to maybe get promotions or raises or at least other opportunities in the workforce. One of the other things we're actively developing is a forensic science concentration or at least certificates so that people can also get more skills there as well. So we have a lot of things happening, many opportunities around the nation as well, which you're gonna be hearing about from some of our partners and support system today. So if anyone has any questions as you're reviewing this later, or of course throughout this, um, open house today, feel free to reach out to me or email me. My email address is on this PowerPoint, but it is cshuni, C-S-H-U-N-I at dcc.edu. And I will say now that we're back on campus, um, I do have a body farm that is going to be ready come May. So if anyone's interested in working a little bit on some decomposition or forensic anthropology, I'll be doing some of that this summer. And I would love to show you guys What's going on out there? So keep in touch and let me know if y'all have any questions. And again, thank you all for supporting us and attending today. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you, Charlie. And um, that was a great introduction. So Dr. Noble is in class, so we are not able to um, discuss chemical technology in the depth that she would um, be able to discuss it. But we have had a lot of success with our students in chemical technology. We also have a wastewater um, program that a lot of our students do take classes in, and that gives them, again, a more variety, more robust set of skill sets. The wastewater technology program, we're one of the only ones in the state that offers the training and the certification testing for it. 
So again, lots of different routes that our students can take and have um, exposure to within um, the program of SLT. So we have a packed schedule today. We have a lot of great speakers. Um, we are gonna go through each speaker. They have 20 minutes and we are hoping that there will be five minutes towards the end um, for questions from the students or any of the attendees. And then at 12 o'clock today, we will have a short break. You know, if you are able to come for the whole thing, that's wonderful. If you have to hop on and off, we totally understand. But again, we have um, a lot of speakers lined up, a lot of great things. This entire presentation, it does introduce you to the SLT team, as well as different student testimonials about their experience in the program and where they are now um, with their either their education or with their career um, moves. So this has been placed in the chat. It's the SLT open house presentation. And on the presentation, as Ms. Shunick stated, we do have our contact information on there for biotech, chemtech, and then all of the directors, our lab coordinators are also on here. So before we get started, does anyone have any questions for Ms. Shunick or myself? So if this was my class, I would start playing a cricket song or Jeopardy song. I did not come prepared today for that though. And then Charlie, before we get started, I know you were talking about the forensics um, CDCs. Did you mention the biotech and chemtech CTCs? Well, I mentioned that we're developing, developing them. them. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up to say that they are in curriculum and our goal is that they're approved in curriculum for this month, which means that we will be able to start implementing them in the fall. So that's also exciting news for us. And we have a few new courses being developed right now as well. Yeah, we have um, intro to microscopy and histology being developed. We have a biosynthesis course that has been approved through curriculum, but the curriculum has not been fully developed yet. So it is not you know, ready to be taught quite yet, but uh, lots of different cool opportunities. Um, Dr. McGraw, who is on the call with us right now, has um, been part of a grant, an EPSCoR grant for biosynthesis. So we're waiting to see if that grant is awarded. And Dr. McGraw also does a lot of work with our first speaker, Dr. Levine um, with the Algae <clears throat> Foundation. So that's really exciting. So without further ado, I am excited to introduce our first speaker, um, Ike Levine. We were fortunate that he came to the campus in February of 2020, just a few weeks before COVID um, shut down our campuses. And since then, he has just been an integral part in the growth of our program. So I'm really excited for him to um, introduce himself and talk about opportunities that um, he can provide students as well as career paths. Um, Ike, do you have any PowerPoints that you need to share? Yes, I do. If you okay. can open up sharing, that'd be great. It's all you. Oh, that's too much pressure. <laughs> You okay. sit on your toolbar, you should see a green box. There we go. Screen. All Perfect. right, here we go. Um, slide, no, I gotta get rid of that. Good. Well, thanks uh, so much for being here. And um, I'm so sorry uh, uh, to hear about the, the tornado. I did email, uh, Claire and Amanda are around two o'clock this morning just to see if they were safe. Uh, I'm in Maine. We don't get tornadoes in Maine, so that's a phenomenon we we really don't um, uh, we really don't experience. So um, uh, we're really sorry for what you had. And if there are questions from anybody who watches this uh, in the future by recording, uh, feel free to contact me um, uh, and stuff. Uh, 
if you have any questions. But the question is, I'm here to talk about algae, the biotech of algae, the chemical nature of algae. Um, and the question is, you know, why algae? And then I'd ask you, why not algae? Because right now, I, you know, about four or five years ago, uh, a young lady came up to me and said, you know, Dr. Levine, you're cool. Now, I've been a science geek my whole life, uh, and no one has ever called me cool before. So no one ever grows up saying, oh, I can't wait to play with algae. I mean, you want to be a first responder, an astronaut, you know, a, a dancer, a doctor, but certainly nobody grows up wanting to be a, a phycologist, which is someone who studies algae. So maybe by the end of the day, maybe some of you will consider it. Uh, I, I don't know, but it's, um, algae has been very, very good to me. And I, I believe it can be really, really good for many, many people around the United States. So now the question is, how do I get this to, ah. So the question is why algae? And uh, this was put together by a colleague of mine at Global Algae. And I, the first time I saw it, I said, this is just too far-fetched. Algae is not going to do all of this stuff. Well, I've spent about a year looking at this, um, at this slide. And I have to say I was wrong because the gigaton scale farming of microalgae and seaweeds off the coast uh, of the, the continental land masses will actually do all of the things that are on this list. So if this list excites you, being able to decrease poverty and, and perhaps keep the elephants from being uh, driven to extinction, to maintain or uh, our reef systems to thrive, to preserve water from not having to use it for agriculture, to, to, uh, you know, to restore the Colorado River Basin, uh, so water actually ends up in the ocean, uh, to, um, to alleviate the pressure on the rainforest, then maybe you should think about a career in algae. And in fact, the next fall, I'm teaching a seminar, and this slide is the entire course. The entire course is based on this one slide. So that's how important algae can be. So it, maybe you've never seen algae. Well, this is microalgae, phytoplankton, the, 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 the things that were in the summertime, if you see a, a green scummy pond, that's microalgae. Uh, but this is what farms look like around the world. Um, Cyanotech is in Hawaii. Uh, if you look at the, the upper left-hand corner, there's a little tiny red streak. Well, in 1982, that was the size of the farm. And across the road from it, I built the Hawaii's first tank seaweed farm next to it. And so Jerry Shashevsky has been very, very successful there. Earthrise is in the desert, Imperial Desert of California. Uh, and it tells you the other countries that are involved. So uh, algae farming is uh, ubiquitous around the world. Even seaweed farming around the world from the tropics uh, to the Arctic Circle. And so you're, you're, you're trying to learn about um, biotechnology and chemical technology. So I'll, I'll skip the parts about growing the algae and our curriculum uh, that deals with cultivation. And let's stick to the basics. Algal biotechnology, algal chemical technology. And, and, and uh, let's look at to the bottom right-hand corner. You see, I guess that's a water sneaker. Well, a colleague of mine, Steve Mayfield, uh, a professor at the University of California at San Diego, created a company called Algin Ensense, and they have just received uh, 50,000 pairs of this shoe. I'm not crazy about the color, but the point is these are the first biodegradable plastic shoes in the world. And what are they made out of? Algae oil algae oil. So in terms of chemical technology, you, you know, the ability to turn lipids and carbohydrates into new polymers uh, that are, are uh, they could be firm um, uh, polymers for algal-based uh, surfboards. They could be softer polymers like you see here. But in 90 to, to 90 days to six months, if left on the sand or the beach or in a landfill, they will biodegrade into nothingness. Think of that. Think of that one concept of chemical technology where the billions of tons of plastic that shape our oceans and fill our landfills and go up our smokestacks and incinerators became biodegradable. How cool is that? On the left, we look at what can you get out of 
algae biomass. And so we can turn some of it into biofuels, or we can get about 40% of it um, uh, to be lipids. And we can use those lipids for many, many things, omega-3 fatty acids uh, for one of them. Um, about a third of it is, is protein. Protein for animals, protein for fish, protein for humans. Carbohydrates, what can you do with carbohydrates? Well, you can turn them into bioethanol. Um, you can also turn them into um, uh, different base sugars for uh, an amazing amount of, of, of effects. And you have ash. Um, you can put that in, in your soil as a conditioner. But some of um, uh, the products that you get uh, from uh, algae in terms of um, either direct, you know, just drying the algae and putting them in pills but, or, or extracting some of the base products, uh, all of which you would learn in chemical technology. And in terms of uh, more chemical technology, these are some of the things that we're turning them into, into fibers, into cloth, into ink, into plastics, into leather. Uh, and you can see all of these products that you see here are made out of algae. That is a remarkable conversion of the last 15 years of, uh, of chemical and biotechnology engineering and some of the companies that are involved. And so think of Adidas. You know, when I grew up, they, they had the, the leather shoes. I mean, that was a pinnacle of, of, of being a ball player. And, and now to have them made out of algae, how cool is that? Okay, uh, sometimes algae is grown indoors. And in fact, one of the greatest places to farm algae is Iceland. And people look at me, Iceland, here I am mine. It's cold, it's dark. Half the time, the sun doesn't rise. And that's true. And, and that's true. And, and I've been in Iceland. And yet the reason that farming is, is so popular, uh, commercial farming of algae is so popular in Iceland is because of the volcanoes, because of, uh, of thermal conversion energy, because of wind energy and uh, um, uh, hydropower, electricity is almost free. And uh, heat is free from the uh, geothermal energy. And so the uh, free heat, free electricity, and rents are very cheap. And so you can grow these um, on the lower left-hand side. This is hematococcus. This is uh, the red pig pigment astaxanthin. That's what makes um, um, salmon red. How does it work? It goes up the food chain from algae to shrimps, from shrimps to fish, and, and thus you get red, um, red meat in, in a salmon. Uh, and it comes from a green algae. How weird is that? And so again, um, chemical technology and biotechnology enhances the ability of humans to grow to stuff. And so this is what uh, you know, algae look like. And uh, every day we're coming up with new products uh, through um, uh, through the ability to, to uh, uh, create different forms of the algae in our biotechnology courses, working with Amanda and Claire, you're going to have the ability at uh, DCC to, whoops, turn that off, sorry, um, the ability to um, um, uh, increase the quality or add different products to your algae. And so again, learning the basic skills is really, really important. So again, where are these, uh, the, you know, the opportunities? On the left, you see what is the value? Biofuels, you get very little out of it. But if you go to the bottom, well, we're talking tremendously um, valuable products that come from algae. And this is all about learning the techniques of both biotechnology and algal-based chemical engineering. So, you know, having the ability to have both sets of classes at your, um, uh, at your school is an amazing uh, opportunity that you all should take uh, take advantage of. And so you'll, you'll see in my background, it says the Algae Foundation. This is um, what we do. We do everything that has to do with algal-based education from kindergarten through graduate school. And the green, the darker green countries are the countries we're in and all the red dots and blue dots on America, that's where we're located. In fact, you can see a little blue dot where um, New Orleans is that represents your school that is a member of the ATEC family of schools. And so on the right-hand side, you see the flow chart and you'll see community college biotechnology degree in Austin Community College. That's in Texas, uh, but the curriculum that we developed there is available uh, for you at, um, at Delgado. So that's an exciting opportunity that you have there. 
And so just uh, we have a farming degree uh, based in um, Santa Fe Community College, and we have this um, community uh, college based algal biotechnology degree. It's tremendously exciting. Uh, you don't have to, each school doesn't have to take the entire set of curriculum. They can take uh, and pick and choose which of the labs from all of our different lab primers um, uh, that, they, that they would like. So I've gone through this quickly because I, I was given three prompts and the three prompts were um, uh, to talk about career, the background to develop and what are the degree requirements. So, and, and I take this part of my job at the Algae Foundation very, very seriously. How do we create opportunities for young people? And it's amazing, uh, you know, I've spent my most time at Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico, helping them develop curriculum. And to see the, the self-awareness and the, and, the, and the ability to, to have confidence in oneself to, to do better has been a remarkable transformation. Our students have come into our courses thinking, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get this course and hopefully I can get a job. Well, it turns out um, not only do all of our graduates get jobs, but they're, they're also competing for and winning full scholarship rides to the University of New Mexico and New Mexico State. And not only that, we're very surprised that our, our graduates um, start their own companies. In fact, not only do they start their own companies, uh, they are now um, uh, hiring our graduates uh, that have come three and four years after they have. So we have them successfully staying in school, successfully completing school. Not only do they have now a pick of the litter of algal based jobs uh, in the country, because I have companies wanting to draft entire graduating classes, but they also now have options because they're doing so well in terms of full scholarships to finish a four-year degree. Now, do you need a four-year degree to start uh, algal-based biotechnology or chemical technology? Well, it helps, uh, but uh, I will tell you in looking and in, in approaching um, uh, algal-based biotechnology companies, if you look on their job uh, boards, everyone says four-year degree. Well, now they say four-year degree or an ATEC, which is the Algae Technology Educational Consortium's two-year degree. So yes, can you get in uh, the base uh, job a platform with a, uh, a two-year degree in biotechnology? Yes, uh, but your, it's always, some people would say, better to start a little higher up with a little bit more training. Not sure, that's a personal choice, that's up to you. But our curriculum uh, offers the ability to enter a new and exciting world of algal-based biotechnology and algal-based um, chemical uh, engineering. And so I couldn't be more pleased uh, with uh, uh, your school, Delgado Community College, in accepting some. And again, it, it may expand as time goes by. Um, we couldn't be more tickled by uh, uh, both your chair, Amanda, and Claire McGraw. Uh, both of them uh, have been intimately aware of what we offer at ATEC. And in terms of of where this career uh, can go. You saw at, uh, in the last speaker talk about where are our graduates now? And so just, just to touch base, where are our graduates now? Well, we have some working on space algae. In fact, they've put algae uh, up into the International um, uh, Space Lab. Uh, we have um, a group of students who have won national contests against graduate schools in engineering. Uh, using algae to absorb uranium uh, radioactivity um, uh, out of waste ponds in New Mexico. I guess they have a lot of old uranium mines in New Mexico. And so they're using algae to do that. Uh, we have, again, we have internships. And don't ever forget the importance of internships. And I can tell you this for a fact, in the state of Maine, where I'm from, that 90% of our interns are offered jobs at the places where they did their internship. Uh, we act as a clearinghouse for algal-based internships, both at natural national laboratories, and they offer fully paid full-time internships for 
graduates of two-year degrees schools, graduates of four-year degree schools, and graduate degree uh, people who get their master's and doctorate. So they have three separate internship programs. Take advantage of, there is so much opportunity and all you have to do is work hard and have a passion. Work hard and have a passion. There are plenty of mentors out there to help you in these fields. Don't hesitate to reach out because you know our job is to make you successful. The more that you succeed, the better we feel. And I mean, my goodness, is that not a win-win for you all? Uh, it's fantastic. So I'm gonna stop there. And because I, I, I got about seven minutes of, of, of time for questions. I know questions may be limited uh, because, well, um, you know, there's not that many people uh, actually uh, on because of perhaps the, the trauma of, of the storm last night. Um, so uh, if someone who's reading the chat would, would uh, ask the questions out loud, I'll try to answer it. If not, I could go back to talk a more story about how cool algae biotechnology and chemical engineering is. Um, Ike, are you allowed to talk about the algae prize initiative? Oh, sure. I can talk yeah. about the algae prize. Trust me, if you guys want, I could talk till the end of the day. So talking is never the issue. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, let's see if I can get out of here. I guess I can't. Uh, oh, stop sharing. Uh, the algae prize is a new initiative started by the Department of Energy. And they've asked me to be the director of the Algae Prize, where the Algae Foundation is organizing a student uh, competition. And what is it, what are we competing? Making algae better, better farming, better products, better uh, better ways to to do little farms, better ways to do large farms. And so we just closed registration for this year, and we ended up with 64 teams. Uh, and after all of the um, uh, you know details, we ended up with 60 teams. Uh, 14 of them are high schools. 14 of them are high schools. Six of them are uh, community colleges, and the rest are universities and graduate students. And so uh, we gave a webinar uh, to all of the 60 teams, and and I let the you know there's a graduate team from MIT, you know the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the best schools in the world. And I bet them that some of the high school teams are going to kick their ass. So um, don't be intimidated by going up against these, you know, the, these real eggheads. Uh, I, I'm betting that uh, on, on uh, I think it's April 18th or April 20th when we announce the 15 finalists, uh, you know, and I'm not involved in judging. So I could say this, there's no basis for it except my gut feeling. I think there's going to be a several high school teams as finalists and several of the community college teams as finalists. So it is a competition, uh, whereas the team, at least a minimum of two people on a team and one, uh, one faculty advisor um, come up with a hypothesis. Um, they now, those 60 teams uh, on April 6th have to hand in a 10 page research proposal, which we call the research synopsis. And they'll have a full year and those 15 teams will be invited to the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. And they will present a poster and a video. And then they will, will give a 20 minute presentation uh, with a PowerPoint and they will have new panels of judges. And we will declare five winners. Those winners on Saturday night will go head to head and we will declare one grand champion and uh, the winning prize is 25,000 to the grand champion, and I believe 20,000 for the uh, four runner-ups. So we're talking, you know, 25,000 dollars, nothing to sneeze at. So um, uh, I, you know, it's uh, the next round will probably start October of 2023. It's, uh, it's about an 18 month to 20 month cycle. Um, There's a very serious competition. Uh, open to high schoolers through graduate students. Um, and it's very exciting uh, in terms of stimulating how to, how to grow algae better, maybe do transgenics, maybe other genetic manipulation. So there's your biotechnology degree, uh, creating a better plastic. There's your chemical engineering degree. So there's, there, there's almost nothing you could do with algae that wouldn't qualify to be a team member uh, 
for the Algae Prize. And so uh, we, we couldn't be more excited um, by this. Other questions? It looks like one of our speakers from the USDA has some of the scientists in her unit that study algal blooms to produce geosmin. I'm not sure what that is. G-E-O-S-M-I-N and M-I-B to look at off flavors and catfish aquaculture. So there you go. It makes our <laughs> fish taste better or worse, it looks like. Well, we have, again, one of the biggest uses right now, um, because you know the big farms are looking for massive markets, and the biggest markets, of course, are the unlimited market of biofuel, and the next is feed and food. So right now, most uh, farmed fish are fed smaller fish in the form of fish meal and fish oil. Well, we're looking to eliminate use of fish uh, um, fish meal and replace that with algal meal and save the commercial fishery of, uh, of uh, herring, uh, minhaden, and anchovies and sardines. And in terms of sustainability, aquaculture would be, uh, would take massive leaps forward if they used algal-based feed and not um, uh, fish-based feed to feed fish. Well, that is awesome. Um, I do also want to plug one other thing that Ike is very heavily involved in is that is the K through 12 curriculum and getting algae into the classrooms. So the students are exposed to it at a young age and his um, project also does summer institutes for teachers. So they've um, paired with a program we have at Delgado and they're hosting 25 Louisiana teachers for their summer science algae institute. So they're really hitting every single level of education for our students to be exposed to for careers in the long run. So we cannot thank you enough. And one last thing for the students, ATEX having their meeting, as long as we have nothing go wrong with the weather in the fall <laughs> in, in New Orleans at Delgado. So we will have the whole crew from the ATEC um, members in New Orleans, hopefully in the fall, October-ish, sometime around then. And everything we do is free. Our K-12 program is free. Our curriculum is free. Our massive open online courses are free. And you know, the first couple of years I had to define what free meant. You know, nobody believes when you say things are free. And so everything is free, but you know, now that I think about it, maybe it's not so free because if we're coming to New Orleans, we're gonna trade for some of the best recipes and local food you got. But other than that, it's free. <laughs> Well, I cannot thank you enough for giving us your time and introducing all the wonderful things that algae can do to our students and our fellow teachers. And so thank you so much, Ike, and we will see you in about three weeks. Right. My pleasure. Stay safe, for everybody. God bless. So um, can everyone see my screen? Good. Good. There. Okay. So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. It is Dr. Sohela Malika. Did I pronounce that right, Dr. Sohela? It's Maliki. Maliki, sorry about that. Um, but thank That's you so okay. much for coming. And um, Dr. Maliki is from the USDA and the USDA has been an integral part of our student success and supporting us with internships and opportunities. So for no further ado, I will let Dr. Maliki um, take the stage. All right. I'm trying to let me share my screen first. All right. I'm gonna to have to take the zoom down here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to on the right screen. That's because I've got a double screen that's in the... Um,
Am I sharing my screen? Yes. All right. So hopefully you're seeing the big screen. Um, or are you seeing a screen with all your faces on it? We can see your um, presentation. Okay, perfect. It's because I have one on the uh, the larger screen. So yeah, my name is Sohela Maliki, and I work at the USDA, which is pretty much down the street from you guys. And yes, we have been involved in research with Delgado. We've been very excited about that and getting um, students from Delgado because there's a lot of research. Obviously, we're the agricultural research branch of the USDA. In other words, <clears throat> except for all the paperwork that we have to do, we're basically 100% research. We don't have uh, teaching duties or other types of uh, responsibilities. Our responsibilities are 100% research. Our labs are expected to, um, we do basic research, but a lot of our work is um, to help the community, help U.S. businesses. So um, that's part of what the Agricultural Research Service was established for, is to interact with the community um, or an agricultural community and other communities within that area and to help um, solve local problems. So there's four centers for the USDA, Northern, so Southern, which is us, Eastern and Western. And then there's a lot of um, other smaller substations um, that work with local communities. So for example, the algal problem I was texting about or chat in the chat was that People work with um, catfish can all can all sometimes and you may have noticed it have a little bit of a dirt dirt flavor, and that's from algal blooms. So, a lot of our research one you one group of our research unit is interacting with um, the community, the aquaculture community that grows catfish, and um, tries to figure out ways to eliminate that off flavor whether it be through food processing or studying the algae or um, looking at the aquaculture itself. So without, this was way more introduction than I was expecting to give, but it seemed appropriate at this moment. Um, but my, my, my presentation is mostly about my story to tell you how I got where I've gotten and the journey that I went through. So I was, um, my father was Persian. My mother was um, is American. And so I lived between the two countries. And what, um, this is actually a picture of me back in Iran in 2014, which was like probably around 30 years since I'd been back to Iran. As you know, they've had issues there. But I made a trip and it was wonderful. I graduated from high school in Iran. And I came to college at, in the US. I never questioned whether I should go to college because that was kind of ingrained for, in us from the time we were very young. So when I got here, I went to school at University of Tennessee at Mart. I lived there and went to school for about five years. The population in that city was around 10,000. It was a little dinky, town. And if I didn't tell you where it was or that it was, nobody would ever know about it. It's part of the UT system. And here I got the red circle around University of Tennessee, the northwestern section of Tennessee. And basically 6,000 of the population were the students. Once they went away in the summers, it was like a deserted town. Um, so it was a, I would say, fairly no-name school in a little dinky place. Um, it was it was great. It was a great place to start without having to deal with the hustle and bustle of a larger city. So I was a pre-med major. I majored in chemistry, minored in biology. And in the third year of our, uh, when I, third year of college, I actually, they brought in a biochemistry teacher. I'd never heard of biochemistry. I'd studied chemistry, physics, and biology, but I'd never heard of biochemistry. 
um, I was very excited when I learned about it. The concept was really difficult to grasp, but I knew I was fascinated. So I tried to participate in some research while I was um, uh, while I was an undergrad, uh, and that actually started with um, being a junior member of the American Chemical Society, and actually got my first grant back then, and it was for like a hundred dollars, and I I can't even remember what it was for, but I think it was to do with having to make a cholesterol model. It was about a focus on lipids, and we were going to make one of these models with the um, with those little balls, ball and stick. Um, but also having a presentation about cholesterol and lipids. So in biochemistry, I volunteered to perform some research in my professor's lab. Again, I didn't know anything, but um, I learned how to take blood from a tadpole. That's about <laughs> one of the things that I uh, remember doing is he would treat the tadpoles or grow them in different conditions and I would take their blood and measure um, the heme in the blood of the tadpoles. I can't tell you a whole lot about it. I didn't have a deep understanding of it and I struggled through biochemistry but again I you know I enjoyed learning about it you know these molecules of life. Um, I worked about 30 hours a week and um, waitress, bartender. I w didn't have any money here. My parents were both in Iran. There was a war going on. So I had to work to get through school. I was qualified for a Pell Grant. Again, there was, my parents didn't have any income here. And so that was really helpful. Um, it took me five years to get through college, but part of it was because I had to work. and. Um, juggle the the two. So I graduated from uh, University of Tennessee at Martin uh, for, as a pre-med major. Um, and I got my major in chemistry and minor in biology. And let me see, did I misplace one of my slides? Oh, here we go. I went fast. So after I graduated, I'm like, okay, so now what do I do? Um, do I have skills for an actual job in chemistry or biochemistry? I wasn't sure that I did. I, I, I think of college as a exercising your mind, but I don't know. I don't know if I actually learned any skills to go directly into a job and be able to do a chemical, you know, be a chemical techn technician or a, any kind of a bachelor's level job. Um, so I thought, well, do I need to take a break or should I go to, I was pre-med, maybe I should go to medical school. So that summer after I graduated, I spent about a month in uh, an internship at Cleveland Clinic. And as the previous speaker said, the internships are really important. Well, in my case, it was important in a very big way. I realized, you know, after going through several departments um, in the hospital and as an observer of how, you know, seeing patients or radiology and so forth, I realized this is not at all what I want to do. And it didn't all have to do with the fact that I had to wake up at six in the morning. Part of it was that. <laughs> so um, I decided to take the GRE exam and, um, instead of the exam, uh, the MCAT, because again, I still, you know, had the uh, love of biochemistry and that was supposed to be my second plan. And boy, I, did I need it once I had that realization. So I decided I'm going to take off a year and I went to Dallas. I had a boyfriend there. I was going to go and find a job and it ended up being a disaster. I couldn't even get a job as a waitress. Let's put it that way. So I went from a dinky town of 10,000 people to Dallas, which was, I think, like 3 million people at the time. Um, I was terrified of driving on the interstate. It was really large. 
it was difficult to get around because I have no sense of direction whatsoever. And so overall, I was just, it was, I was very scared as far as, um, am I going to find a job? What's going to happen in my future? How do I get to this and that and so forth? So um, I had taken the GRE. My scores weren't sky high, but they're passable. And, but I hadn't applied to anything. <laughs> Over a phone call with my mother, I told her that, you know, I think I want to go to graduate school, but I haven't applied to anywhere and I don't know where I'm going to go. And, you know, a few weeks later, she called me. She was a nurse. She had run into some, my mom never met a stranger ever. She gets in an elevator. She knows everybody's phone numbers, their grandkids and their pen pals for life. So she actually was working in uh, somebody from, uh, she met somebody in the elevator, <laughs> actually rode up with her. And turns out this woman was coming to visit her father and on the floor that my mom was working. And she asked for, um, she found out that this lady worked at University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. She was telling her all of, she always does this, we complain, but she tells everybody our entire history or all our secrets. So she told this woman that her daughter, she had a daughter that was getting depressed. She was worried. She wanted to go to graduate school and so forth. And this woman told her, well, there's somebody in the biochemistry, molecular biology and biochemistry department at UAMS. They had a student coming from China. At the last minute, that student got an offer from a different school. So now they happen to have a vacant position. Go figure. How does that happen? But it did. So she calls me and tells me about this. I literally get in my car and drive to Hot Springs, Arkansas, where she lived. Spend the night, and she, I'd called and gotten an interview. Um, put some, put a suit on, and that morning got there at like three in the morning, four in the morning. By seven a.m., I was at UAMS for an interview, and I got I got accepted, and I, it was just a very exciting part of my life to be able to go and get it accepted into graduate school. So uh, there I did, <clears throat> and we did six different rotations. When I started in my first year, you went to different labs and spent two months there and got an experience, and then you got to pick a mentor. Well, I started a project with two mentors, and we were studying muscle development. It involved finding specific proteins in um, the muscles of rats. They have the slow twitch muscle and the fast twitch muscle. It's kind of like the white and dark meat. And basically it failed because they were so low a levels that no matter what treatment you gave them, you couldn't detect them. So it wasn't anything I did wrong or anybody did wrong. We just didn't know that was gonna happen. We didn't have the methods to detect them at the time. So after two years of being in graduate school, I still didn't have a project because I spent a year trying to detect those proteins. So I started a second project and um, with one of the mentors and I uh, completed that project. And I'm gonna tell you about that. It, it involved uh, proteins uh, in muscle development. So at least a lot of the knowledge and reviews and papers that I had read applied, but this was a uh, completely different in other ways. So the long-term goal was to understand genetic regulation circuits. So for example, when a cell intera cells um, interact with all kinds of environmental cues, whether it be chemicals or hormones or proteins or other cells, um, these are done through receptors on the external part of the cell. Um, then um, chemical reactions happen and uh, messenger proteins, I should say, signal transduction happens, and these proteins uh, uh, transfer the message into the nucleus. And once in the nucleus, specific proteins can bind to the DNA molecule and cause um, certain genes to be made or expressed. So, and these are um, known as transacting proteins. They, the basic helix loop helix proteins of transcription factors is what they're referred to, bind to DNA and control 
um, what genes are made. So in my case, I was studying muscles. So we wanted to understand the protein, protein, and protein DNA interactions that involved muscle-specific gene expression. The MyOD basic helix loop helix family of proteins, uh, which were fascinating to me because if you took these transcription factors and you expressed them in any kind of cell type, they could turn that cell type into muscle. So um, for the first year, I started the project. Um, by the second year, my last two years of my graduate school, again, that took me five years as well, um, I received a DOE EBSCOR grant that after I had some preliminary data that paid for my entire salary for the last two years. But basically, this is just the changing of um, different types of cells eventually into a myotube or a muscle fiber. So this is... Um, the basic domain of the protein involved in DNA binding, as I showed in the previous slide, the helix loop helix areas and involved in interaction of the proteins or dimerization binding together. Um, and these proteins can come apart and bind to another protein, another family member and so forth. And um, there was a particular sequence called the E-box um, with the DNA sequence C-A-N-N-T-G and that bind um, that is where the proteins bind, and this is something like what it would look like. So my studies involve looking at uh, two different proteins. In this case, let's say that's MyOD, and then E12, which was promiscuous. It could bind to a whole bunch of other different uh, helix loop helix proteins. I looked at their interaction, uh, heterodimers and homodimers, and their interaction with DNA. And multiple, many, many mutants of this particular site to be able to tease apart half binding or what protein binds and so forth. This was, I did a lot of these binding experiments with a fairly simple, um, and I can't see my clock. So if you could give me a warning, because I'm a little slow right now. But <laughs> I imagine if there's not a lot of questions. Yeah, we're, like, we're about time up. Time's up already? Uh, almost, almost. You can. Oh, okay. Keep going for like another minute or so. Oh my goodness. So um, basically um, I studied these transcription factors and I was able to get three different publications out of my PhD. Um, I, this is my whole dissertation summarized in a single page is all the thermodynamic equilibria of these interactions. Um, I did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences. My main project resulted in just a book chapter. A side project resulted in uh, three immediate papers and 40 to 50 more papers after that, once I got my job. Um, I studied, uh, my postdoc was in food allergy. I'm sorry, I might have taken too long on this, but um, basically uh, I got a job at USDA to look at the effects of processing on food allergy. Meanwhile, we all, whoever was in New Orleans knows that we went through Katrina. When we came back, we lived in a trailer in the parking lot of our job. Um, so that happened in between it all. During that time, we were displaced to back to UAMS where I went to school. And I used that time to do, we, I did a little bit of research, but pretty much everything was in the labs were destroyed. Um, meanwhile, I edited a book. I studied the effects of processing on allergic proteins, what happens to them, whether they're, how they're altered, how they interact with the immune system. And in the past 20 years, we've been able to describe many mechanisms of what happens to the allergens and how their structure is affected and how, where exact binding sites of human antibodies are and the very specific modifications that happen during processing. Um, this one, um, I was, this is the most important thing based on all these experiences of our research with processing and allergenicity and structure function, we were approached by a company at the US uh, um, that had three employees to help them develop a protein 
for use, peanut protein for use in oral immunotherapy, increasing doses to desensitize. Um, so this was developed in 2021. It was um, this company, uh, FDA approved it and it's on the market currently. Um, this company was later purchased by Nestle for $2 billion. It started as a startup company with about 2 million or something. Now, um, palforzia is the very first food that ever was ever characterized as a pharmaceutical and it's very first FDA approved treatment for food allergy. This is really important because remember that dinky college I started at, it doesn't matter where you go to school, it's what you do with it. MIT or not, and I agree with Ike. So I was a finalist at Service to America Medals. This is important in a lot of ways, particularly for Women's History Month right now. <laughs> um, a lot of the nominees and then finalists were women and the winner was a woman that worked on Zika virus. Um, and this is like they say, the Grammys of science. Um, then of course the COVID epidemic happened. My lab went from a nine person team down to just me and the lady I started with, Michelle Po Chang. And the most important part of this is that people are your best assets. Whoever is around you and surrounds you, works with you, for you, or is your boss. I wouldn't have gotten any of this done, none of these achievements without Shapo. Sorry, I went slow on the first part. And of course, these are all a lot of the people that have contributed to this research over many, many years and um, contributed to my success. And sorry again, if I went over time, I can't see my clock once the screens are both uh, up. It but is, anyway, thanks, it is I'll take any questions. Perfectly fine. I do want to bring up that um, Dr. Malika is um, bringing a research project to Delgado with our students with another fellow um, faculty member, Dr. Nesbitt. Dr. Nesbitt had to hop off to go to class, but we are really excited for that project to begin. And the lab for that project, it's um, hopefully will be finished being built in um, for fall semester. So all the furniture is ordered. The lab is outfitted to be a BSL2 lab. So we're really excited to have that research come to campus. Yes, we're also very excited. And I just want to say that uh, the USDA, I know this pandemic happened and a lot of, um, you know, we came to a stop. The USDA is opening on March 28th. It will, um, it, it's, it would love to have students back for internships, uh, volunteers and some perhaps paid positions. Um, but we're looking forward to having the students back hopefully after May that's gonna start. And I'll be glad to put you in touch with anybody. And I'm definitely letting our unit know and our um, center director to make sure everybody knows that we re resume the previous activities of um, the students coming to the USDA. And thank you so much for the opportunity to give you this talk. We definitely appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. So our next speaker, um, I have been working closely with over the past year. Our next speaker is Dr. Russ Reed. He um, is the executive director at the National Center for Biotechnology Workforce at Forsyth Tech. And I have been fortunate enough to work with him in the capacity of a leadership institute. So he is trying to help mold me into a better leader. <laughs> so. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to give it up to you, Russ, and let me stop sharing so you can share if you need to. Thanks, Amanda, Charlene. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really, uh, really excited to be with you guys. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I've got to claim that I'm not a doc. Okay, so that's the first thing. I just want to put that up there. Um, you know, I, I've worked in this industry, um, in the biotech industry, in the pharma industry, amongst the best and around the, around the brightest. And uh, I'm always in awe of people who have been able to get their PhD or their MD, but I didn't go that route. And so I think that uh, in this discussion, what I what I what I want to um, tell people is, I think that that might be the beauty in what uh, has happened in my particular case and can happen to anybody, which is, um, you know, I start off kind of like I, I like Dr. Malachi's 
talk and, and Iris as well. I mean, uh, the bottom line is, um, you, you know, I had a passion uh, for science as a kid. And um, I was brought up in a, in a house which was very sports oriented. So sports came first, academics probably came somewhere down the line, but there was a nerdy part of me which said to me, maybe I can do a lot of it, but not necessarily anything too good. And uh, so what happened was I, as a, as a young guy, I could find myself on one particular, at one particular time doing something um, along um, biology because that was my favorite subject. But then at the same time, I might find myself developing a rocket. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to get into too many details because, um, you know, they were, they were testing times for my parents. And, uh, you know, I think that what happened was it, it, it really um, solidified in, in my case, my love of science but it almost burnt the house down. So, you know, I think we, sometimes we just have to um, uh, remember uh, what it was that changed us in life. Um, so um, uh, lo and behold, um, I grew up pretty quickly and I'm very sports oriented. I'm playing, you know, sports in school. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a high school quarterback, you know, I, I'm, I'm on the wrestling team when I'm not on the football team. And, you know, then I took up snow skiing and all that sort of stuff. So, um, and I ended up teaching it. And uh, so I found a way to put myself through school. And it was very important to me because, um, you know, I, I have this um, sort of a strange thing in me, which is very competitive. So, um, you know, what I did, what I would do, and what I would, what, I, what I would find myself doing is finding ways and means of being able to have uh, good experiences, that would end up financing what I really wanted to do. So for me, when I was in college, I had several jobs. Um, and uh, sometimes I was a, a lab tech helping support, whatever. And other times I might be sleeping in tents for a tent company, or I might be, um, I might be doing something like lifeguarding in the summer, or I might be teaching skiing in the winter. But this gave me money. <laughs> and, and at the time for me, money was um, important because it, paid the way for me to be able to go to school or it paid, paid myself to be able to take a course that I might be very interested in. So you guys are in New Orleans and uh, I'm a person from Montreal, Quebec. And there is a lot of synergy between Montreal and New Orleans. They're great, they're great cities, they're great towns. And um, people, you know, have a joie de vie, you know, a joy of life. And uh, so, you know, it wasn't all study. Uh, sometimes it was it was um, a, a lot of play. I was uh, wasn't a member of a fraternity, but I went to a Catholic school, Catholic college, and uh, the you know I, I really admired the, one of our priests who was uh, who was the chairman of the biology department, and uh, you know he invited me to uh, to come into the biology department. And uh, he said at the same time, he said, I, I, I noticed you play a lot of football. And he said, I, I, I noticed as well that, uh, that um, you know, you're, um, you know, kind of an, like, an average student, but I want to give you an honor. I want to give you an opportunity to, to do the honors program. And I looked at him as a father, that would be uh, far too stressful for me. Um, you know, so if you don't mind, I, I would just like to major and honoring, uh, I'll leave that for later. So, um, but I, I really loved uh, uh, biology, but I began to understand a little bit more about medicinal chemistry. And so I, I kind of got excited by that. And I really felt that medicine would be the place for me to go. And, um, you know, so I, I said, okay, you know, maybe being a doctor would be good. Um, and then during the summer when I was, and this is why I mentioned lifeguarding, um, a lady who's, um, kids I was teaching how to swim approached me and she said what are you going to do when you graduate and I, I said to her well I'm, a, well I'm a little mixed up because I, I really like to do medicine but I, I don't think I'm going to get in my grades are average but they're not they're not great and um, she said I'd like you to meet my dad um, he's a doctor and he works for Roche Pharmaceuticals and so uh, I said that's fine so I went over and met him he gave me a tour of 
Roche Pharmaceutical Company, which at the time was a very big company in our area. And then he, uh, he sat down and he took me to the, to the lunch room. They, this happened to be the executive lunch room, which was pretty nice. And he said to me, you know, your name sounds very familiar to me. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, well, I'm the namesake of my grandfather. And he said, your grandfather was my very first patient. And uh, that really hit home with me. And then I began to feel a sense of something that, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe I should be really listening to this gentleman and maybe I should really understand what he might be saying. And what he was saying is there are lots of careers in our industry within the biopharma industry, which don't necessarily require terminal degrees of which can be very exciting and so forth. And I, and I said to him, well, I'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind. And so um, when, I, when I was in my senior year, I took a course outside of my discipline. I took a course in accounting. And I absolutely loved that particular course. And then I reflected on, upon graduation and said to myself, you know, I'm going to see whether or not uh, the pharmaceutical industry might be something that I could get into. And sure enough, I got a job in pharmaceuticals. And uh, it was more on the, on the sales side of things. And then all of a sudden, the bug for me to go back to education came back into my mind. And so I went back and I decided that I would take um, a, a graduate degree in administration. And, um, and, and that sat well with me. And then at the same time, uh, you know, I'm very competitive. So at the same time, I decided to go back and take my teaching degree in biology and chemistry. And um, so um, fast forward, um, after I complete those, and I did them up, up by the way, they were, they were things that you could bolt onto your degree, so they didn't take very long to do. So I, I thought about it, and I, I said, you know, I like the teaching degree, that was fun, and I like the administration degree, that was good too, but I said, I think it's time for me to go back to industry. So I did, I went back to industry, and this is where I got another break through a medical doctor who actually said to me, uh, I want you to take this job at Burroughs, and I'll name the company, was Burroughs Welcome. And he said, I would like you to do, uh, help me answer um, questions from customers and so forth. And he said, you'll look them up, do the research, and at the end of the day, you'll write out the responses and I'll double check them to make sure they're right. And then all of a sudden I found what it was that I wanted to do for the rest of my life at that time, which is, I, I, want, I just love doing that. I love researching the drugs, I love researching um, uh, the medications, and, and lo and behold, um, you know, I'd found where I wanted to be, but they had, the company had a different plan for me. And the company saw that I'd had a teaching degree, saw that I'd administrative degree, saw that I had an undergraduate in biology and chemistry, and they put me on a fast track. So fast track really means that they saw a lot of potential in me and they wanted me to do different jobs in a sequence so that uh, in fact, uh, I could you know, keep moving within the company. And so lo and behold, I stayed with that particular company for the next 23 years. And I, when I look back, I did roughly uh, 15 positions with them. Um, and what was very exciting at the time um, for both of you to know is that you know, we were really uh, starting to do some serious clinical trials. And in particular, we were doing clinical trials in the antiviral area, that was what uh, Burroughs Welcome was really well noted for. In fact, uh, most people today probably wouldn't even know the name Burroughs Welcome, but Burroughs Welcome is now called GlaxoSmithKline. And um, Burroughs Welcome invented a compound called acyclovir. And acyclovir was the first oral antiviral agent to be used to treat uh, herpes simplex viruses and varicella zoster viruses which is basically shingles or um, cold sores. And um, so I was in early on that and became part of a clinical research team that developed those drugs um, and developed the variations of those drugs. And um, quickly that led me to um, other opportunities within Burroughs Welcome uh, from an educational point of view. So the education comes back and I ended up being um, a training manager for the company. And I was very young at the time. And then I ended up um, 
after having been a clinical research associate and scientist. And then I became, uh, they asked me if I would manage all the national teaching sales force, which was actually going to go and sell this drug to specialists across the country. And so I, I you know, I did that and that changed me. I began to travel, you know, traveled a lot. I began to be um, very much involved with the design of studies and so forth. And then, um, you know, they had another plan for me, which was to learn the business side of, of commercial development of pharmaceuticals, which was, you know, very, very cool and very exciting. And uh, so um, that ended up having me um, be involved with a project called AZT. AZT, for those people who are old enough, was the first agent to be used in the treatment of HIV disease or AIDS. And AIDS at the time when I was involved with it was not curable. It was not even sustainable, but AZT um, ended up being a compound that gave some hope that said that maybe pharmacotherapy of HIV is possible. So, you know, I was very involved with that. And then that subsequently Glaxo was very involved as well, uh, developing a compound up in Canada called 3TC. And 3TC was an invention that, that actually uh, um, came out of Emory and, and McGill University. And so um, when the two companies joined, they looked for a person who had both AZT experience and 3TC experience and had the business experience, but the clinical development experience, and that was me. And so uh, I ended up running a team in Canada and we launched that compound, um, which was uh, basically AZT 3D. 3DC compound, which actually showed in combination with another compound called the protease inhibitor, a very good way of being able to tame the virus for a longer period of time and created um, some options for patients, which was really good. Um, fast forward, Glaxo and, and uh, Glaxo and Welcome have joined together. Fast forward, Glaxo and Smith Klein come together. And then I left the company at that particular time um, because I had been transferred to the U.S. Um, and I was uh, running um, a global strategy for one of the drugs, one of the newer uh, HIV drugs that they were having within the Glaxo um, uh, company. And uh, so I uh, had one foot in Canada, one foot in the U.S. And uh, my wife said to me, I like North Carolina, let's stay. So I left the merged company and um, I came to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I um, worked with Wake Forest um, to start up a small company, which we call Kuchera Pharmaceuticals. And Kuchera Pharmaceuticals, I was the CEO of that company, and my job then was to develop an HIV product and also potentially a cancer product. So I was with that company for about several years, and I, my principal job was to raise money for the company so that we could do the research development that we wanted to do. That was a very important compound because what it was trying to do was make the uptake of AZT easier uh, and more selective and safer. Um, unfortunately, our preclinicals, which were done in animals, came out that it was fairly equivocal to AZT. So we didn't push, the company didn't go forward. And so at that time I had to think about, well, what am I gonna do with my career? And I really liked Winston-Salem. I really like North Carolina. And so I had been on the advisory committee, uh, the local biotech program, which was just starting. And the president of the college at the time asked me if I'd come over and look at a new grant he'd won and see whether or not I might want to take on the grant. I refused him a couple of times, I think, but then eventually I took it and it was start of what we call the National Center for Biotechnology Workforce, which was a a large amount of money from the U.S. Department of Labor involved five sites across the country. And then fast forward that, I've been here 18 years and uh, we've raised uh, approximately $23 million in federal funding, most of it from the Department of Labor, but a lot of it now is coming in from the National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Division. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a ride, it's been fun. And Amanda, as you know, um, I don't fool around when it comes to professional development, uh, and we really pride ourselves on professional development uh, through the initiatives that we do with Innovate Bio, um, our big national grant, 
uh, with Dr. Linnea Fletcher. Um, I like to make professional development as real and practical as possible. And so, as you know, in the leadership program that you're taking with us, we don't give you fake cases, we give you the real stuff. How's that? It was wonderful. Um, I'm maybe still a little scarred from all the work last semester, but I'm wow. coming through. I'm coming through. No, but it you're was going to be stronger for it. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. They actually presented us with real um, problems that companies brought to Russ and allowed Russ to introduced to our teams and our teams actually presented back to the companies, whether it was the CEO or the researcher, we presented potential solutions to their issues. So it was definitely an experience. So what we what we kind of like to do here is um, uh, we, we try to get ahead of the curve. And so through whatever we're doing here at, at through our, our facility here, a couple things. One is you know, we have a, a very nice analytical lab. So Dr. Malachi, you're welcome to come and see our lab anytime you'd like to. Um, and, uh, you know, we just want a grant with, for a QTOF. So we have a QTOF in here, it's very nice. And it, it, it needs, it, you know, it, it's just at that point now where it's getting some use and it's very exciting. And so I have a, a lab coordinator, Dr. Jason Gagliano, who handles that uh, part of our of what we do and then we do the best practices in there and so you know amanda we published the with our large dol grant um core bioscience skill standards and also the medical device skill standards and just recently we're on a project with a few other colleagues um, who actually produced uh, gene and cell therapy skill standards skill standards are the basis you know that's basically those basic skills that people need to work in those functional areas um, so, you know, we have a lot of grants going on right now. Um, uh, Amanda, I know you're good friends with Tom Tubon. We're working on a Biomed grant. Um, we're really excited about it. We just had a meeting this morning, um, and it's to use uh, small handheld DNA sequencers and uh, portable electron microscopes to look at soil microbes. So what we're going to be doing is teaching teachers how to do that. That so, sounds right up Ms. Schunick's forensic biology. I was about to come and, in. <laughs> so we may need to find out more about this grant, Russ, because that yeah. is exactly what Charlie's doing with her body farm. Yeah. So we're talking June 14th and 15th. And, you know, uh, Charlene, you want to come, you know, and, and, and you, you want to take part of that course, I think we can make that happen. That would be amazing. It's yeah. booming in the world of death and de death investigation, looking at that. So so you know I, I, what I, I what I honestly as a personal philosophy I'm, I'm very committed I'm well beyond retirement age I do this because I have passion for it I heard passion many times in the previous speakers I think we all have passions for it um, you know what we do and you know for me I was you know as a kid who who loved science but at the same time didn't have a clue you know how to necessarily progress in science and, and I think what it was was a series of mentors these people that took me under their wing, they saw something they, that, that, that they saw that I had spark. They knew that I had the drive and they, you know, they wanted to help me uh, get there. You know, and in particular, I, I'm very thankful to, um, to uh, the MDs and PhDs that I worked with at Burroughs Welcome. One in particular, Dr. Ron Keeney and another that hired me was Dr. Raymond Dougal. Their pictures um, uh, are, are always on my desk. One of the things I'm seeing from the speakers is having that support network are people that believe in you and inspire you. Even if you aren't the top student, they see something in you that shows that you have the grit to be successful. So students yeah. take note, hard work does count. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think too that different, you know, I think um, we learn this a lot in a life cycle of a, you know, when we're planning um, a business or a drug or whatever, that people go through different phases. And I think you're, as a person, you have to consider yourself going through a different phase. So, you know, it's situational, right? So um, I think what I really like what's going on here at, at our college, which is Forsyth Technical Community College, is we're, we're, we're making sure that students who don't necessarily see themselves in the positions that they might be, 
that somehow, some way we counsel them or we guide them or we remove the barriers for them so that they can get to where they could possibly elevate themselves to. And for some people that's, you know, maybe maybe doing a PhD, but for other people it might be might be actually getting into the workforce and taking on a, a skilled technical workers type job. Yeah. There are many, many facets. Um, you know. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask um, Russ? Mr. Reed. I, I have a question about your Q, uh, QTOF. Is that in y'all's um, center where the companies are able to come use it if needed? Exactly. Or is that specific? Okay. And what are companies primarily using it for right now? Well, we, you know, that's, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question then. We, we have a, a pharmacist uh, who has traveled the world to gather exotic plants. Her name is Annie Greeson. She's a pharmacist. And um, basically the back half of the lab she rents from us and she has her plants stored there. And these are exotic plants from all over the world. And she went personally on trips to uh, rummage these plants. She would sit down with the local healer, drink tea with them, whatever. And she would say, uh, can you tell me the plants that have specific properties? And, you know, ones for like maybe back pain or, or whatever. And so she's brought all those plants back to here. And what she wants to do is she wants to be able to analyze those plants and look for actives in the plants. And so the QTOF will be instrumental in helping her get to where she wants to go with them. That just sounds amazing. Like yeah. a project that, I mean, that project is going to be outstanding when she starts it. That's great. Now, I just wanted to say thank you for the invite. I would love to come see the facilities. That would be yeah. fascinating. If, if anybody's getting a group together to come and see the facilities, please let me know or, you know, I can get your contact information. I would love to. Well, I'll we'd, share it with you. Uh, we'd love to have you. We, sh we should actually probably at some point just do an orientation and we'll make sure that those people would like to come in and see it can for sure. Well, uh, Amanda, you're, you're going to be seeing it very soon. Yes, I think so. And I think I'm going to ship Charlie to y'all soon. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Russ. I appreciate you taking your time out of your day to support our program and help our students understand the different pathways that they can go in their career. And um, really, really appreciate it, especially your support over the years. Yeah, Amanda, well, you know, we love what you're doing too. And um, can I just say something too, is that, you know, um, companies will invest uh, as, as do universities and so forth. We had this discussion uh, not too long ago, actually. But companies will invest in uh, programs for people as universities will. Universities might have a little less uh, disposable cash to do it, but companies have wonderful programs to um, accelerate your careers. And uh, I can think of a leadership class that I was in, um, and this one happened to be with Black So Welcome. And when I look back at that leadership class, you know, going, going back over decades now, um, it's just brought to my attention that uh, it's, it's quite possible that, that upwards to two thirds of the class all became CEOs. But when you look at the backgrounds, you look at their backgrounds, yes, some of them have terminal degrees, but many don't. Many have undergraduate degrees. And what's really interesting is some don't have undergraduate degrees in the sciences, which makes sense, right? If they're running the company, they're the business of the company. So they had to even overcome the fact that they probably didn't even truly understand the science, but they understood the person who was actually communicating the science to them so that they could make the right decision. So there are just so many jobs that are out there in the bioeconomy. And so there might be something that's very appealing to somebody who's just strong on communication, you know, 
Um, and so I think that what I want to make sure that your students know when they review this tape is, hey, I'm a good communicator. I like to communicate and I'm very good at that. Well, you know, there's an opportunity there. Yeah. I, I think that's a really great point to make. Well, we really appreciate your time today. And I think you gave us some really valuable information. I wrote down a little bit of what you said for inspiration moving forward. And um, I'll see you soon, Russ. So I hope to see you all soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Bye. So next, we have a speaker that um, had an emergency come up at her job. So since Dr. Noble was teaching this morning, and I know I did not do justice to the chemical technology concentration, we're going to let Dr. Noble speak for about eight minutes, and then we will have our next speaker, Ms. Morris, come in. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Amanda. So I am Dr. Noble. I am the chemical technology director, and I'm also one of the instructors for the program. Um, in terms of research aspect that we've been working on in the program with some of our previous students, we've been analyzing soil samples that deal with the Lafitte Greenway. And we have done um, pH testing. Um, we have Ms. Becknell who has done some testing as well. So we've looked at pH, we've looked at phosphate and just some other chemical compounds to test the soil and we're waiting to do um, atomic absorption on our soil samples. Um, with the program, we have analytical chemistry, instrumental chemistry, um, as well as like advanced organic, where we go through going into rather the use of the instruments that we have in a lab, whether it's the IR, which is the infrared spectroscopy, spectrometer where they can do the spectroscopy techniques as well as the NMR, the nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, we have the AA, which is the atomic absorption to test any heavy metals that may be in the soils. Um, we have the HPLC, which is the high performance liquid chromat chromatogram. And then we have the um, GCMS, which is gas chromatograph. Um, so we've just using those instruments, also learning how to take certain um, aspects of those instruments apart and fix those instruments, as well as being able to identify what each piece of the instrument does. So again, we'll just open up the instrument and go into more detail about um, those aspects. Um, but besides that, um, that's basically it. And I want April real quick before Dr. Noble hops off um, mm -hmm. and goes back on mute to briefly just talk about your wastewater program. So we started a wastewater program. So we have wastewater technology in which we have water treatment, water production, water distribution, wastewater treatment and wastewater collection. So those are five areas in water technology that we have. We have partnered with local utility companies such as the Sewage and Water Board and a company as well as um, in Chalmette in St. Bernard Parish. Um, with the program, you learn how those water areas basically work and operate. Um, you do have a chemical aspect where I do tie a lab portion into the course, but it also preps them to prepare for the, the state exam. So if you do not have any type of training or experience, you're able to take the course, get the hours, and then you're able to test and get a certificate and upon you getting the experience, then you would get a license. For those that are already with the utility and have the experience, then upon you testing, you would get your license. So you have four different um, levels. So if we're talking about, for instance, water production, you have water production one, two, three, and four. And then as you get the needed um, hours in the material, then you would 
go ahead, take the test, and you would get a license. And then basically, say if you take all of the courses, get all of the licenses, then you would have, um, I believe his name is Corbin or Gorbin, the guy who runs the sewage and water board, you would be able to run a utility, basically. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions as the wastewater program for Delgado is extremely unique and very much in demand. So yeah. April has definitely done a phenomenal job getting that up and running. Now COVID has given us a few <laughs> obstacles, but you know, the whole world's gone through those obstacles. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. This is Tony Jones. I'm just curious, does any of that involve um, tracking the COVID virus that's in the wastewater or no, that's not part of the chemical? That, that is be. part of it. So that would be part of the wastewater side. So that would be in wastewater treatment as well as wastewater um, collections, where even for the West Bank uh, City Park location, not City Park, Delgado <laughs> location, um, they've done testing on the wastewater. So basically, um, if we're at the city park location and we're testing the wastewater and we say that we have a high count or it shows for building 22, then we can say, well, hey, how's the testing going in building 22 with um, faculty, students and staff because we have a large concentration. So that's you know a possible outbreak that we can have amongst those that are in that building. So you are able to, you know, do some type of identification and kind of mitigate and not have, you know, a large outbreak, but that is included in the wastewater side. Thank you. You're welcome. Tony, well, I think you need to take some classes. From yeah, Tony, <laughs> one, of our, uh, one of our classmates is modifying his degree so that he can do some waste and water stuff with Dr. Noble. So that if you're interested, that's something we could talk about. No, ma'am. Chemistry and I have a love-hate relationship, and it's winning right now. So. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Tony, we'll get through it together. <laughs> so yeah, I Prayers and lots of tequila on the weekend. Thank you. I'm old enough to drink if anybody's going to say I'm, I'm old enough to drink. <laughs> We've all been there. I, if anyone says they haven't, they are fibbing. Yes. So I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Megan Morris. She has been a huge supporter of the SLT program with her role at Access Sim. So without any more delays, I would love for Megan to um, take the stage. And Megan, I'm going to stop sharing in case you okay. want to share your screen. Yeah, that'll work. All right, can everybody see that presentation? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Um, first of all, good morning, and thank you for having me uh, speak again. Uh, last year was really fun, so I was, I was glad to get asked to do it again this year. Uh, like she said, my name is Megan Morris, and I'm the Director of Operations uh, for AxoSim here in New Orleans. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what AxoSim is uh, first, and then what I do here. And then I'm really just gonna kind of tell, uh, tell you about my odd little journey of how I got here and a few things that I am definitely still learning along the way that I think um, could speak to some students right now. Um, I consider myself one of those cases of like, I wanted to go into the medical field, but I didn't wanna be a doctor paired with this non-traditional type of career path um, mixed with, of course, a little bit of like, I'm still figuring out what I wanna be when I grow up. <laughs> and as I understand it, um, I think a lot of you are either in an associate's degree program and have intentions of continuing towards a bachelor's degree or maybe head out to the workforce trying to figure it out. So I kind of feel like this story may strike a little bit of a chord with you um, just because you're in the middle of your program just trying to figure out you know, where to go next. There you go. So what is AxoSim and what do I do? Um, AxoSim is a neurodiscovery service company and what that really means is we help uh, our pharmaceutical partners develop drugs faster, uh, safer, and cheaper by being able to test their compounds on some really powerful in vitro platforms. 
And so we can give them uh, neurological data that better predicts the data that they would see if they gave that compound to an actual human, except we can do it in a lab. <clears throat> we, uh, we can use our two, like I said, proprietary in vitro platforms called NerveSim and BrainSim to mimic neurological responses to drugs in humans. And in general, the nerve sim you see at the top is a platform that mimics the peripheral nervous system. And the brain sim, the one on the bottom, is a platform that mimics the central nervous system. And ultimately, we use these to help the drug development process uh, move along faster and cheaper. And what that means in real life is that companies can find cures or treatments to neurological diseases or disorders faster uh, and for less money, ultimately out of the pockets of the people that are battling those diseases. So what do I do here? Um, as I said, I am the director of operations, so I do exactly what that sounds like. <laughs> I direct the operations. Um, I oversee all the studies that we run here and I manage all the people that actually design and execute those studies. It is a whole lot of hard work, um, but it's, it's quite rewarding. Our, our company's mission uh, is really easy to get behind because like who does not want to be a part of finding safe treatments for things like ALS, MS, uh, or even just reducing the neuropathy that is so commonly associated with things like chemotherapies and uh, diabetes. But also on the day-to-day -day side of things, uh, being able to see my team make breakthroughs and develop ways to generate really reliable data is it's just plain awesome. Um, these folks are my team and I'm really proud to be able to lead them. Right now, our team consists of about 21 scientists, research assistants, bioengineers, and various support professionals. Uh, most of the folks that I oversee are research scientists, study directors, uh, research associates, and assistants. And at AXOSIM, our entry level job is called research assistant. And these are the folks that are in the lab every day, pipettes in hand, growing cell cultures and running various assays on the cells that I talked about, uh, either with or without test compounds um, applied to them. We have a lot of developmental work along with client work that goes on in the lab. And as, as these folks gain uh, skills and experience, they can be promoted through the ranks of research assistant up to research associate levels based on their skill proficiencies. <clears throat> so, how in the world did I end up being the director of operations at Axosim? Um, I'm back up for just a minute. <laughs> I came from a family um, full of medical professionals. My dad is a retired orthopedic surgeon. My mom, both of my sisters are nurses. My aunt is a dentist. My uncle is an OBGYN. But for whatever reason, I did not get that gene. And I did not want to go to medical school or be a nurse. <laughs> Um, I love biology, I love science, I love the idea of the medical field, but I just knew I didn't want to be a doctor or nurse. Um, growing up, I think all I really knew for sure was that I like to build things, create things, take things apart, uh, figure out how they worked, fix them sometimes when they weren't even broken. And in high school, what that translated to for me was to be an engineer. Um, what I ultimately decided on after taking all those aptitude tests that I'm sure everybody took uh, was that I was gonna be a mechanical engineer. I had enrolled in the program at LSU and I was like packed and ready to go. And about two weeks before I moved to Baton Rouge, um, I got this pamphlet in the mail about biomedical engineering um, at LA Tech, I believe it was. And immediately I was like, what is this? I, I can marry biology and engineering and actually get a job. Um, so I switched majors and I switched to biological and agricultural engineering. Uh, when I was at LSU, I got a student worker job at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. And there I was able to learn a lot of the basics of research, um, some special assays and how to handle and breed a whole lot of mice. <laughs> but what I really got to see was the interaction between researchers and what it was like to work with them. What I saw was a whole lot of collaboration among a bunch of different types of people, all trying to find solutions to problems. And that was really attractive to me. Um, I, 
ultimately graduated my, with bachelor's degree, um, but I still wanted to pursue that medical path of engineering. So I decided to stay local and apply to Tulane's uh, biomedical engineering PhD program. In 2005, in the fall, um, Hurricane Katrina hit, and that was supposed to be my first semester there. The university shut down for the semester, so ultimately I started the following spring. Um, and about a year into my program, I came to the realization that I didn't want to be a professor and I probably didn't want to be a traditional researcher. So I figured a PhD program at that point probably wasn't the right route for me. So I transitioned into their master's degree program um, and graduated in 2008. And that is when I got my first big kid job. Um, and that is definitely where the real learning started. So that first job uh, out of grad school was with a company called Bioengineering Group. And contrary to what the name of the company might imply, this job had what I at least thought was absolutely nothing to do with biology. <laughs> we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to design all the new levees in and around New Orleans after the damage from uh, Hurricane Katrina. And about, about three years later, when we were done redesigning all the levees and flood walls, and after a lot of them had been actually repaired and rebuilt, uh, I realized this job did have a lot to do with biology. Every person's future life that we saved by protecting their homes, um, every animal's home that we avoided disturbing to build the levee either higher or wider. So what I learned was that my perception of my career of what it could be was even less black and white than I already thought it was. And I think what I was reminded of was that I needed to stop um, and look up from whatever I was doing and look up at the bigger picture and see what I was doing and what I was actually learning. I went on uh, to spend seven years at a company that had even less to do with biology. I worked for a company called Global X-ray and Testing, and they're a non-destructive testing company, which means they performed different types of quality tests on pipe welds. Um, and honestly, I took that job because I just needed a job. <laughs> but you can see that I started as an inventory and purchasing manager and then moved down this sort of path of managing different aspects of the same business. And what these different jobs did was provide me with an opportunity to learn how a business worked from the inside out. And I was able to dive into the details of different areas of that business and develop processes that ultimately improved the way the business worked. Um, I was very grateful for my experiences with these companies, but I was still looking for that connection to biology. And so every now and then I would do the whole job search thing. Uh, but honestly, I, I genuinely didn't even know what I was looking for. I felt like I had been away from traditional biology for so long that, that I wouldn't be able to get back in. Um, I felt like I had you know, gotten this fancy engineering degree, but I wasn't an engineer. Uh, so I started to think, okay, what skills have my seemingly random jobs given me? And what have I learned from my past experiences that could translate to a future job? And in my efforts to find those answers, I not only found AxoSim, but I also figured out I really was an engineer. I was collecting, absorbing, analyzing information in order to creatively and systematically come up with solutions to problems. And at its core, that is exactly what engineering is. Um, one day I was laying on my sister's couch with her sleeping newborn on my chest, scrolling through Indeed, um, and I found a job posting for AxoSim, and this job has absolutely been one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Now I get to use all the things I learned from my previous experiences and education to oversee the operations of a very cool biotech company with some really incredible life-changing technology. And I think my biggest take-home message from my story is if you don't know what you want to do with your degree, if you don't know exactly what you wanna be when you grow up, um, it's totally okay. I, I think most of us, if we admitted it, we are still figuring it out every day. And it, it changes sometimes. Um, but I think the most thing, the most helpful thing that you can do for yourself is to look at the things that you learn how to do with a different light. 
ask yourself, what did I really just learn and how can I apply it elsewhere? Um, as you saw from the previous slide, I have had a handful of jobs that maybe on the surface didn't seem like they fit together, but they all taught me one common thing and that it was, I have a lot more learning to go. I, I wanted to mention um, two things that helped me tremendously during college and that are definitely still the most helpful for me every day. Uh, the first thing is learn how to learn. I'm, I'm not saying don't study, but in the act of studying and in, in the act of learning, try to figure out how you in particular figure out the answers to things that you don't know. And the second thing is, and probably biggest, is about the attitude that you bring to school and to your job every day. Be open to the knowledge of other people's experiences. Be open to opportunities, even if they don't seem like they fit into your plan. Just be open to them. Sometimes they can open a door you just did not expect. Um, be absorbent of the information that is thrown at you and don't be afraid to question things, especially things that do, don't seem to make sense. Continue to ask questions until it makes sense. Um, be curious and stay curious. Always asking question, questions is a really powerful thing. And I think the last point is to stay humble. There will never be a day where you know it all. I, I promise you. I am currently surrounded by absolutely brilliant people that actually report to me that know way more about science and neurobiology than I ever will. And if I wouldn't come to work every day with a little bit of humbleness, I, I, would, I would never be good at my job. Um, I learn from them every single day and, and I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, even when you're an expert at something, there's somebody somewhere that you can learn a little bit more from. Uh, yeah, so I thank y'all for having me um, and letting me ramble. <laughs> I put my uh, LinkedIn profile up here. Uh, that's definitely the best way to reach out to me in a networking capacity, but I also put the website. I definitely encourage everybody to visit that. There's a lot of great information there. Some videos that explain how our technology works, um, some publications that we've been a part of, and I believe when we have job postings, the, um, the Indeed link is up there on the website. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. I know something else that Accessim offers is um, a few times a year, y'all do webinars, which is great. Okay. And that gives our students and faculty opportunities to learn some of the cutting edge information that's occurring within the lab. So something that we try to advertise every time that we see it's happening. Good deal. And if you um, if you go to the website, I believe you can sign up for the AxoSM newsletter and that will always have uh, an advertisement for when those webinars come up. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Morris? Um, Megan, I do have a question though. I know that the job openings are publicized on Indeed do y'all still publicize internships or have the internships um, mostly become jobs? For now, I think the internships have mostly become jobs. We're in this um, odd little growth phase where we're going from like a small company to a medium sized company. And so um, that coupled with the like heavy developmental work we have going on right now, uh, it's difficult to bring an intern in just for like a couple of months, but um, I'm very, very open, and I think we've talked to at least two student uh, researchers. So if if there's an interest in like a part-time but longer-term position um, from a student, I would absolutely be interested in that. Thank you. Um, we definitely do have students that are interested, um, and we have a lot of students that want to stay in the New Orleans area. So that gives a little bit more longevity to their um presence of applying. Yeah, we uh, we definitely love when local people apply. Um, we have some people from all over the globe, um, but I always get a little twinkle in my eye when somebody local applies. <laughs> and then Megan, I'm not sure if you can speak to this because it is related to accessing, but not directly under what you would be doing. But 
the um, one of the founders, Michael Moore, Dr. Moore, mm -hmm. he works with high schools with biotech to get it into the into the um, system. Do you know much about that? I actually don't. <laughs> okay, but what I was saying is that biotech is becoming an overwhelmingly popular field of study, and the opportunities are now being presented at the high school level, which is great because then students have a little bit better grasp of what's going on moving into an associate's or bachelor's or further education program. So yeah. lots of opportunities. Yeah, there really are. Um, and right now we are hiring for that research assistant position, like full-time positions. Um, so definitely if there's anybody that's coming out of the program or maybe has been out you know, even for a couple of years, um, if they're interested, please, please tell them, send them my way. <laughs> Definitely will. We have quite a few students that are either finishing up their bachelor's or have been in the workforce for a few years. Perfect. Any other questions for Ms. Morris from the team? I'm just hoping we'll be able to get some students back over to y'all for tours once things settle down a little bit more here so hopefully we'll see y'all soon touche you can uh, uh we can definitely talk about that we've had a few um outside tours come through if they're small enough we can definitely handle them now i had one quick question as well for your research associate position what would you say the number one skill you'd like students to have coming in um, honestly, cell culture and uh, like aseptic technique is the is the core of everything that they do, and that's it's a little bit difficult to teach on the fly. So if somebody has that foundational knowledge, it's very easy to integrate them into the rest of what we do. Um, outside of that, I would say incredibly strong communication and written skills, uh, because we're a commercial entity there is a level of documentation that doesn't necessarily exist at the, um, at the academic level. And because we report to clients, so literally everything has to be you know, reported. And then there's a level of auditing that we see from clients um, that's not necessarily seen at other levels. And so the ability to be able to you know, really concisely um, and scientifically write and document data is, is absolutely key. Thank you. I appreciate you stating that. This is something the instructors do, um, you know, discuss with the students often, but I think it's great hearing it from the actual clients and the working world, that it is as important as the instructors stress. Hands down. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Thank you for um, adding that into the chat. Awesome. Thank you all for having me. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You've become a regular in our events, and we definitely um, are very fortunate to have you as one of our supporters. I, I, likewise, we're fortunate to have you all as a, a, almost like a feeder program. You know, you're, you're grooming the people that are going to eventually work for us. So, um, yeah, feelings mutual. Well, for everyone on here, we are going to take a short 20 minute break. We are going to keep the room open and just pause the recording. And we um, hope that you return at 1220. And if you have class or if you have another engagement, that is perfectly fine. This is being recorded as well as live streamed. But um, run to the bathroom, grab a bite to eat. And we hope to see you back at 1220 when we will have a, represent, um, a representative from Dow speaking with us, an, uh, a graduated student. Amanda, do you wanna just go ahead while we're on the break and just play the, uh, the welcome, the SLT welcome for anybody that's gonna stay? Yeah, do you have, I don't have linkage. Can you share your screen and do it? I'm driving the campus. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess we could do that either or. I can share it. I'm like right down the street. Okay. As soon as you get on, um, I'm not going to share my, well, I'm going to share my screen, but I'm going to be in here. And then when you okay. get ba back here, just let me know and I will give you sharing rights. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
that. That's kind of like more of an intro um, covering the whole cell. And also, I just picked up um, bioethics and bioinformatics, which seems to be quite interesting. I just thought my share, Amanda. Perfect. Um, so we just had a nice little 20 minute break. Everyone stretched their legs, went to the bathroom, grab maybe something to eat or drink. And I'm actually going to let, uh, oops, if I can get it. I'm going to let Dr. Noble introduce the next speaker because it was one of her students. Her old student, she's graduated <laughs> on bigger and better things. Almost, almost graduated. <laughs> so I would like to introduce Miss Alexis Becknell. Um, this is by far one of my students that I am extremely proud um, to have in class as well as to have present today. Um, she doesn't like presentations. She doesn't like when I put her on the spot, but she has garnered so much confidence in going through the program. Um, typically we think just getting the education, going through the motions that that's what's the most important part but we also have to factor in that human aspect. And I am extremely proud to have her present. She has come a long way and has gathered so much knowledge through this program. And I hope her presentation um, speaks to the students that we have coming through the program as well as finishing the program. And also um, to those students that were previously in the program that may be presented today. So Ms. Becknell, take it away and kill it. Okay, if you say so. All right, I'm trying to share my screen. Let's see. Green button on the bottom, you see it? Yeah. Hold on. Okay. I'm trying to um share on my phone because of my Wi-Fi. Let me see. Can y'all see my screen? Not yet. <clears throat> They're on campus and Wi-Fi does not work very well in some of our laboratories because of the insulation and such. Mm -hmm. What about now? We can see it. We the uh, presentation is a little bit small though. Is do you think if you rotate your um, mm -hmm. screen, it might make it a little bit larger? Mm, let me see. Now, that's perfect. If that works for you. Okay. Make sure I know how that works. Okay, it works. All right, so my name is Alexis Becknell. Um, I am a soon to be graduate of spring 2022. My major is science laboratory technology and with a concentration in chemical technology. About me, I live in Chag Bay, Louisiana, which is about an hour and five minutes away from Delgado. I have a four year old daughter. Her name is Hayden. I graduated from Thibodeau High School in 2015. I earned an associate's degree in criminal justice from Fletcher in 2019. On my free time, I like to travel, spend time with my daughter, family, and friends. So these are some pictures. Um, the first one's of me and my daughter, some of my family. Um, vacation, I like to travel, and then my two dogs. So my current career, I currently am employed as an apprentice with the Dow Chemical Company. What is Dow? One of the largest material and chemical companies in the U.S., and they're a leading producer of plastics, chemicals, and hydrocarbons. And Alexis, not to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. you were employed as an apprentice, but we had a job interview, correct? Yes. So we need to talk about that as well and what happened. Okay, I'll get to that after, uh, you know, the next slide. I'm going to talk about that. 
So um, what is an apprenticeship? So um, they're paid on the job training with classroom instruction to prepare individuals for highly skilled careers. And then the reason why I chose to apply for the apprenticeship program through Dow is you know, for the opportunity to earn my degree and still be able to have a steady income because I do have a family at home and you know, bills and for the on the job experience. So the area I'm assigned to, um, I'm assigned to Dow in St. Charles where I work in the polyethylene lab, which we say poly E. Um, we test and analyze plastic. Some examples that we test are for um, the flexibility, the melt strength for containers, bottles, tubing, and cracking resistance. So some types of equipment we use. So we use um, for density, we use a couple of things. We use the XRF, we use that to test the additives in the plastic. Um, we use melt indexers, it measures the flow of the plastic and then the roll mill. Um, we put the plastic, we get it in the form of a resin and um, you know, we pour it on there, it's very hot and then it molds so we can run our density and our um, MI. Do you wanna talk about the NMR that you guys got and the purpose of it? So we're still in the process of setting that instrument in service. Um, right now, we're just running, you know, our, our samples on it, but it'll be an easier way for us to, you know, get our results. Um, right now for, you know, to get our results, it's kind of old school. We're putting it in a, a press, which takes like 15 minutes, and then you have to let it cool down, which is another 15. So the NMR is going to make it easier for us you know, to get our results in a faster way. So hazards, um, you know, through this program, I've learned about hazards and, you know, you really need to be careful when you go into labs or anywhere and know the hazards. So we have very hot plastic and you, you can get burns, you can trip and fall on pellets in the resin and loose clothing and pinch hazards, which, You'll learn, you learn that, you know, in some of your beginning classes in the program. So typical work, um, school week, I have 14 um, credit hours that I take for the semester. Well, actually 13. And through the apprenticeship program, I'm paid for study time credit hours and on the job training, which is a blessing because, you know, you need those hours to study and get ready for all your tests. So breakdown. So my 13 credit hours plus my 13 study hours is 26. And then, you know, you have 40 hours in a week you get paid for, and then you subtract it from your credit hours and study hours, which is 14 hours. So that's how many hours a week I have to go to work and do, um, you know, on the job training. And I usually go to work on Mondays and Wednesdays so then I can go to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So how the SLT program has impacted me. So the experience from the program um, sets me apart from others in my workplace because once I graduate, I will have a degree. And having a degree is something that no one can take away from me. I know that I'm more precise and accurate at handing lab equipment and chemicals from going through this program. Being able to come to class and learn, ask questions, go through experiments that people in the workplace are not able to do. So more chemicals, lab hazards, understanding the importance of releasing information and data, um, in-person labs, hands-on experience, understanding equipment, and how important calibrations are. Before I started, um, you know, my final classes, I never knew that a calibration, you know, would be so important. Whenever I walked into my unit where I'm at, I was like, well, I didn't know that we have to run, you know, standards every um 
every five hours. I, I would have never known that unless, you know, I started my classes, which were very helpful to know some people, you know, you start at your job and you don't really know that you have to do certain things. Um, using different instruments, um, software to analyze, you know, at the lab, I do use different instruments and software. So the program has, you know, helps me understand, you know, you're not going to just run one thing on one instrument. There's many instruments that test different things. Gaining more confidence in my abilities to perform. I'm a very shy person and I'm very hard on myself. So the program has, you know, helped me understand mistakes are okay. We can fix them. Um, making me do things I'm not comfortable with. And then being able to learn, get tips from my instructor, instructors and classmates, which has helped out a lot. And then advice to future students. Basically, you know, just, just do it, just go out there and just try it out. The reason why is because the field is so demanding and the hands-on lab experience is like no other. It is challenging, but it is rewarding. Many employers today require a college education degree. This program will help me have a better future and be able to support my family and myself. I recently um, had an interview in the lab that I'm at, and you know they could have opened it to the public and you know gave someone a job. Well, they wanted me to interview for the position, so I had my interview probably a couple of weeks ago, I think. And um, they let me know that as soon as I have my degree in May, um, May 17th actually, that they are going to hire me full time to work at the lab. So um, it's very exciting, you know, I have something to look forward to. And if it wasn't for this program and the degree, then I wouldn't be in the, you know, the situation I am in now. So I'm very thankful for that. And I think that's it. Alexis, this is um, Dr. Rosenzweig. I just have a question and you, you did state it briefly, but maybe you can go into some further um, detail. When you started the program, what's been probably the most uh, helpful piece of advice or experience that you've had, even when it felt like it was a struggle? Mm. Mm. let's see so advice even when it was a struggle um probably I think with COVID um you know in the beginning we didn't really have labs that were in person so my first you know in-person lab was rough and you know I was kind of down on myself because I didn't know certain lab equipment I never had an in-person um class so having classmates and you know my instructor instructors to help me you know give me advice give me tips you know this is how you do this this is how you do that and I think that is like the biggest advice and help that I could have got because you know COVID was rough not having in-person classes so, um, yeah, my teachers and classmates helped me and gave me advice, you know, studying habits and stuff like that. Thank you. And Amanda, I think that ties into what um, Megan said earlier, learning how to learn. Um, and I was hoping that Alexis did state that because we talked about it in class because she's like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, did you take that? online general chemistry class just to take it or did you take it to understand what they were doing looking at what they were doing or did you just take it to gather the information to pass the class and she said to pass the class and I said that's where we went wrong that's what we need to fix and <laughs> that's true and so <laughs> I kind of let them go on their own you know like I'll give little hints here or there but um she persevered through you really did Alexis and um, Miss Carter was there to assist and from there she's been phenomenal thank um, you learning how to learn Alexis is something that is never ending 
and it it takes time and it's something to strive for and it doesn't come in one semester it doesn't come in one experience so this is something that you'll do constantly as you continue to be introduced to new things and that goes for everybody we all still learn every day megan really emphasized that about being humble and understanding that everyone has something to offer. Alexis, we really appreciate you doing this and um, you made it through the lovely Wi-Fi. Thanks, yeah, it was rough. <laughs> so I am excited to introduce our next guest. He has been a, another huge supporter of the SLT program at Delgado. And he actually um, keeps, uh, keeps us informed of opportunities for our students through some of his um, uh, grants that he includes us in such as iGEM. And he is currently working with um, Dr. McGraw on another grant that they may get. So we hope that happens. But um, for no further ado, I'm going to introduce you all to Dr. Nicholas Sandoval. Nick, I'm stopping okay. sharing. So if you need to share, you can. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll just talk for, for a couple seconds uh, before, I, before I start sharing. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, my name is Nick Sandoval. Uh, I am an assistant professor here at Tulane University in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And so briefly, before I get into um, kind of what the, the lab does and how we view work, I just want to discuss my path here. So I uh, went to uh, public school out in Western Colorado. I went to CU Boulder for my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. After that, I, I stayed there and uh, got a PhD in chemical engineering there. After that, I briefly went and taught uh, at a um, smaller college called Colorado Mesa University for a year. Then I went to the University of Delaware for what's called a postdoc to do more research. Um, and after that, and finally in 2016, I came here to Tulane and joined the uh, faculty. So, the, let me, I guess I'll start sharing now. The overall idea behind what we do in chemical engineering uh, mixed in with this biotechnology uh, realm is the idea that individual cells, and here we mostly work with bacterial cells, although we have a, um, a project with uh, mammalian cells as well, is that these individual cells, these biological organisms, are little mini factories. So we, as, as humans, kind of are, are factories in, uh, in a way where we eat food and we produce carbon dioxide and energy and thoughts and actions and work. And so on a molecular level, what we think about is how do we engineer these living cells to do or produce the things that we want them to do? So normally that is a, an engineering task about changing either what the cells eat. So normally, so for like the biofuel that you uh, use in your car, so when you go to the gas pump, 10 to 15 percent of that gas is actually ethanol and that ethanol is coming from corn so this is uh, the corn kernel so the stuff that we eat uh, it gets fermented like you would do for for beer or wine gets distilled and is the ethanol that goes into your gas tank and that's suboptimal for for a variety of reasons so one of those reasons is that well your the corn kernel is the same thing that we eat and we don't want to have a land usage that is competing fuel versus food. So one thing you might think to do is say, okay, how do we engineer these microorganisms to not eat the corn kernel, but rather eat the corn husk or the corn stalk? Or how about eating carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide uh, directly from the air to produce uh, the biofuel? 
On the other end is, so that's what they eat, what about what they produce? So naturally, things like uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's brewer's yeast, produces ethanol. And ethanol is actually a bad biofuel just for your engine. It's not very good at what it does. And that's why we only limit it to 10 to 15% of the uh, of the, the volume of, of gas that you get from the pump. And there'd be a better biofuel, say like butanol. Or maybe we don't even want to make a biofuel at all. Maybe we want to make some bioproducts that are normally made from extraction from plants, a, a, a fragrance or a nutraceutical. Well, can we impose upon these microorganisms the genes and uh, other elements that are necessary for making these chemicals from, um, you know, sugars or corn stalks or um, carbon dioxide gas, right? And at the center of all of those capabilities really is the ability to manipulate and understand the uh, genome of bacteria and other microorganisms. So the main driving factor behind what we do now versus what was done when I was a PhD student, uh, actually now it's quite a few years, uh, it goes by fast, is that there are two things that happened. One, DNA sequencing got super cheap. So if you look at this plot here, this is the cost per megabase of a DNA sequence. So a megabase is uh, one million nucleotides long, right? So that, that is uh, about a quarter of a bacterial genome. Before, it would cost you $10,000 to sequence a whole bacteria, maybe even more, like the tens of thousands of dollars for a single bacteria. And now we can literally do it for a, a couple hundred, and that might include even multiple uh, that we might sequence. So sequencing got super cheap in the last 20 years. And so did DNA sequencing. So actually, can we write uh, DNA that uh, to, to, to put into the genome? So before we'd have to amplify from existing genes, but now synthetic DNA, we can just sort of go into the computer, type out whatever sequence we want and purchase it. And it also got super cheap. So in, uh, let's see, year 2000, it would cost you about uh, 50 cents per base of synthetic DNA. And that's just super expensive when you're talking about wanting to build a gene that's like maybe a thousand uh, nucleotide bases long. But now I can go on to, to IDT and I can order an entire gene for about $100. And so, so really, the two enabling technologies that allow us to think about DNA the way that we do is DNA sequencing and synthesis got super cheap. So now the big question is, well, what do you do with all this power? Um, how do you go about choosing, you know, what, what experiments to do? How do you um, decide what DNA you want to write and what DNA you want to read? And so the real key here is to understanding how big the... Um, the space is for exploration. So if we take a look at Hamlet as a um, the play, there are uh, surprisingly few, 132,000 um, letters, like uh, N-O-T-T-O-B-E, right? To be or not to be, right? Uh, there are about 133,000 letters. That corresponds to around 10 to the 184,000 different combinations of those letters that could possibly be put together to get Hamlet. So if you get a whole bunch of chimpanzees sitting at typewriters, they would have a whole lot of combinations to go through before they get to Hamlet. All right, let's compare that to the relatively simple E. coli genome, which only has four letters. So English has 26 letters. The genome that we have or that E. coli has or uh, any microorganism has only four letters, A, G, C, and G. The genome is 4.6 million bases long, and that corresponds to an astounding 10 to the 2.8 million different permutations of nucleotides. And this is where the research really is done. There are far too many permutations to just sort of explore them all now that DNA sequencing and synthesis got 
So our main methods in the lab are really honing in on what really do we want to explore? What type of DNA sequences are interesting or not interesting to explore? And the methods by which we do that are methods that um, are, are common, and I think a lot of them are, are taught in uh, the, the, um, the biotech program. That is to say, um, PCR, um, DNA purification, uh, gene expression, uh, protein purification, and the, the various assays that, that go along um, go along with it. The General Sandoval Lab here at Tulane has this general framework for going about uh, doing this exploration. So we have this write, test, read, learn cycle. So we write genotypic diversity uh, on the thousands to millions of scales. So what mutations do we want to make on our gene? What mutations do we want to make on our protein that are likely to make a big impact in what we can observe, the phenotype? So hopefully we have thousands to millions of these things and we test these hypotheses. We test these questions all at the same time. And so that requires us to have some sort of really easy screen or selection. So can we incorporate a color associated with this test? That is, if it does what we want it to do, maybe we can get the bacteria to glow green at the same time and then sort them out based on their fluorescence. Or maybe we associate it with an antibiotic resistance marker. So if we put an antibiotic in the mix, only the ones that we want to will survive for us to observe uh, later. So only the winners come back. Then how do we go about reading the results? And this goes back to DNA sequencing. We can literally go back and read all the diversity that we wrote. And then uh, the questions are, how do we go about best quantifying that and analyzing um, those results? And then from there, once we've gone through that process, we learn, and then we go back to the beginning and write uh, more genotypic diversity in order to better explore our fundamental questions. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing um, and just talk about some of the general projects we do in our lab. So the first uh, is the one I kind of briefly alluded to before, which is about biofuels. So this one. Um, wants to ask the question, how do we most efficiently make the, the biofuel butanol? Butanol has four carbons. However, glucose, the primary sugar that we want to make biofuels from, has six carbons. Okay, so when you go about making butanol, we go from a six carbon uh, sugar to a four carbon product. The problem with that is that those two carbons that get lost along the way, those two carbons go to carbon dioxide, which then gets released by the bacteria into the atmosphere. And so at the very outset, the main limitation is you're maxing out two thirds efficiency in terms of going from all that work the plant did, turn that sunlight energy and the carbon dioxide into sugars, or picking one third of it out into carbon dioxide, again, right off the bat before we even get to the biofuel. And so, you know, so that's an inefficiency problem. So what one project that we uh, recently got funded with is to incorporate a, um, another bacteria that actually eats carbon dioxide and can, in conjunction with the biofuel producing bacteria, work together to eat the carbon dioxide that the biofuel producing bacteria produces, and then give it right back in the form of acetic acid to produce more biofuel. So that's a super interesting project. Um, briefly, we have uh, a project that involves um, trying to make a more efficient mammalian cell that makes uh, biopharmaceuticals. So the, the advertisements that you constantly see for Humira they're made from cells called Chinese hamster ovary cells. It's the main cell line used for production of the monoclonal antibodies or MABs. So any of those um, biopharmaceuticals you see on TV that have like the brand name called Humira, and then there's like the aduminizab or something. 
from the back end. Anything that ends with MAB is a monoclonal antibody. And 95 times out of 100, those are made from CHO cells. So CHO cells are notoriously inefficient. That's why these biopharmaceuticals are super expensive. And if we can make a more efficient uh, CHO cell line, we can reduce that cost. So, but, but overall, the, the, the lab really does explore this on the genetics level. So how do we go about engineering genomes in a high throughput manner to best explore what would make more efficient uh, cells? So uh, let's see, that's about half the time. So let me break off from the actual research and discuss what it's like to be in my job. So like I said, I had to go through a lot of schooling. So it was undergrad, PhD, and then what's called a postdoc where I continue to research. But now that I'm here, my main job is actually mentorship. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm talking with undergraduate students, graduate students who work in the lab and actually do the hands-on work as well as undergrads uh, in the lab to do the research. And I work with them on writing papers, um, coming up with ideas for their next experiment, and um, doing presentations to uh, communicate our research with the world. And then the other kind of uh, part of my job that's really big on the research side is coming up with new ideas and writing grant proposals in order to get more ideas funded so we can continue the work in the lab exploring uh, these interesting research topics. And then, of course, um, as a professor, I do teach courses. So I teach about one course every semester to undergraduates in the chemical engineering curriculum. And, uh, you know, I have a TA and I uh, um, go in and do lecture. I teach class, create homeworks, create exams, um, hold office hours, all that stuff that you all might be familiar with uh, um, as students in the classroom. But um, primarily, yeah, the, the work is um, in the lab trying to explore these exciting new research ideas. How do we improve upon the, um, the existing technologies that are out there to, to make life a little bit cheaper and a little bit better and hopefully more sustainable um, as we go forward. All right, so, so that's, I think, um, most of my time. So I'm gonna uh, get quiet here for a second and uh, see if there are any questions from folks about the day-to-day -day operations or the, the type of research we do or anything else. Nick, would you mind talking a little bit about the iGEM project that I know that went on last year, but due to COVID, um, stuff was uh, finished and not uh, completed for uh, the presentation, but for like your goals and how Delgado fits into that picture? Yeah, great. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. The iGEM program, iGEM stands for the International genetically engineered machine um, competition slash uh, exposition. It's uh, based out of uh, MIT, and, and basically it's a quasi-competitive um, event that really wants to allow undergraduates and now um, they even expand it to, to high schools to explore synthetic biology and how synthetic biology can be used to solve problems in our world. So uh, the way the format works is that um, you can just make teams from, from undergraduates. And right now we have a team NOLA. So we're not team Tulane, we're team NOLA because um, we are incorporating both Delgado and Tulane students in our work. And we have a, a project uh, that involves how to engineer um, the CRISPR genetic engineering platform to be more easily used um, by, by uh, researchers um, around the world without getting uh, really technical. It's about how CRISPR can be um, uh, used to edit multiple genes at the same time more easily. So with that, we actually had a, a wonderful Delgado student who spent the summer in the lab uh, working on this, Joel Winderriedel. Uh, he was able to do a whole lot of stuff this past summer, including uh, doing high throughput next generation sequencing, um, 
library uh, uh, development for um, our uh, for our experimentation, uh, flow cytometry, cell sorting, all sorts of techniques. He was able to to get a lot of experience in, and he generated a lot of really amazing data that we're now uh, working within this year's iGEM um, competition moving forward. And so we have a whole bunch of undergraduates now. Uh, here, Tulane working off the data that he generated from um, what he found. So basically, the general framework is we have a, a team that all work together on the same project. So it's not individual work; it's it's very much teamwork, and everybody works in sort of like a, um, uh, uh, I guess, like a uh, a train where. As soon as someone puts down the, the work for the day, someone else will pick it up at that exact spot and then move on and do the work for the day and then leave the work for, for someone else the next day. So we've just moved out of my lab and we now have a separate little lab space in a, in a building that's gonna allow us to do um, more stuff because it's gonna allow us access um, more than just uh, nine to five. We're gonna be able to access the lab on the weekends and in the uh, early evenings to allow more students to, to participate. So if you're interested, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. And also, uh, Dr. McGraw, who's on the call, is um, uh, associated with this. And you could also email her about possible participation. Um, and so, yeah, it's just about really getting everybody involved in learning lab techniques and getting to apply them to um, a pretty cool project, as well as um, being able to convey, you know, on a scientific level, what we what we're trying to do to a broader audience. Thank you very much for that. Does anyone else have any questions about opportunities or uh, Dr. Sandoval's research lab, our pathways from an associate's to a bachelor's? I have a question about pollution. Sure. So it's my understanding that one of the limitations of having biotechnology, chemical technology really having an impact on the planet is that part of making products that can benefit the planet, it does create pollution in some regard. Are companies, do you know, and like groups like yours kind of working to try to reduce that actively now, like moving forward in the field? Or is that still just one of those byproducts we're trying to figure out what to do with, with all like big productions of stuff, I guess, for lack of an example? Yeah, so I guess I'll go back to the uh, the food versus fuel example. Uh, the one kind of one of the, the bigger problems with with producing ethanol as a biofuel is that um, yeah, it does there is a, an impact in making uh, food. The way you try to mitigate that is you take what's already there and you try to turn that into the um, into the product of interest. So here we're talking about using the waste biomass, that is the corn stalks, the corn husks, all the stuff that's normally left behind and goes to waste. And actually it gets kind of fermented into the ground and some of it goes to, to, um, to fertilize the environment, but a lot of it gets broken down anyway by bacteria and gets released as, as methanol and carbon dioxide anyhow. So the idea is, can we take the existing waste streams behind processes and turn them into something valuable? And so uh, part of the project is, yeah, a greater sustainability by virtue of using the streams that are already waste and using them as the fuel, as opposed to having to generate something new to feed to the bacteria. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, well, I guess that's my time. Uh, um, thank you for giving me the platform to talk about what we do. And I hope to hear from uh, some folks soon about maybe participating in IGEM or um, just any questions that you may have about uh, biotech, synthetic biology, 
and or a pathway to becoming a chemical engineer. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandoval. We really appreciate your support and we hope that some of our students are able to join this year's team. Okay. We have some new faces online. So welcome everyone that has joined. I see quite a few teachers from the program as well as students. So we appreciate that. And I am excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, she runs in the same world as uh, the Innovate Bio team, Austin Community College, Dr. Reed. So um, we're very fortunate to have um, Dr. Rao um, come today and speak to us. She is the one that introduced Ms. Shunick to Dr. Levine and got us involved with ATEC. And she has provided so much guidance and mentorship to our SLT team in the past. And we really appreciate her spending time with us today. So I am gonna stop sharing and let you um, share Pranima. Um, can you hear me? I have been having some post spring break volume control issues. We can hear you, it sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to be here to share uh, some of my experiences and uh, my background with you today. Um, and I want to thank um, Amanda and Charlene to, uh, for giving me this opportunity and this exciting uh, um, opportunity to share my experiences. So thank you again. Um, and before I uh, say anything further, I want to say that uh, this, um, this kind of a, uh, a, a venue, uh, an, a, 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 an opportunity for students to hear from um, other people in the field is excellent because this is something I can tell you I did not have as a student and um, I would have had such a uh, it would have been a blessing to know what to expect and what to see how to uh, uh, visualize my future career um, and this is a great uh, this is a great uh, thing uh, that you've put together and I commend you for uh, doing this um, so with that, I, uh, I want to go ahead, I'll just share, uh, I just have very few sh slides prepared, but I'm going to go in mainly to give you uh, my current career path, what I do, and um, how, I, um, how, I, how, how I came about to doing this, what my educational background is, and also how I like, arrived at this. So. Um, and then I'm um, gonna try and see if I can keep this to under 10 minutes so that I have some time to answer your questions. So let's see. Um, all right. Um, can you see my slide? Okay. Great. All right, so, um, uh, so yeah, you know, my name is Purnima Rao and um, I have a master's degree in biochemistry and um, I started, um, well, first I want to, I want to just to break the ice, I want to say I was very excited that I got conferred a doctorate, <laughs> but I did want to, uh, I want to say that while, when I was in um, middle school, I actually did want to become a doctor, the kind that treats patients, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so um, I work as a grant manager um, for the Innovate Bio National Biotechnology Center uh, that is funded by NSF. It's an ATE center that's uh, uh, for training advanced, um, technologically advanced training to students to be able to get into the workforce. And um, additionally, I also teach in the biotechnology department at Austin Community College in Texas. And I teach um, predominantly uh, cell culture techniques and biomanufacturing, um, introduction to biomanufacturing techniques to the students. And um, additionally, I do coordinate um, internship opportunities and uh, work with alumni, um, as well as industry partners. Um, now, this is just a, a front page of what our website looks like, and we work with um, providing lots of opportunities that you're all aware of, which, which Delgado does such a fabulous job 
of giving projects and hands-on training to students um, as uh, as form of undergraduate research and building leadership. And then, and as we can see, students and alumni get to share, and all of that leads to innovation. That's pr primarily what I focus my current job um, that I do. Now, um, some of the other things that I do is um, networking, networking with people, jumping out there, introducing myself, introducing others to each other, because you never know what new opportunities that can come when you just go ahead and have a conversation, share what you know, learn about what other people do or what they know, how you can apply that to yourself. Um, just the more you do, the more you see the expanse of what the scope of our jobs or what our education actually lies because every day we learn something and it's not it's not just a saying it's actually the very truth and the only way to know that is talking to more people and and, and sharing more information um, that's a big part of what i do and additionally um, grant writing um, seeking funds and uh, making sure that these funds are applied to the right workshops or professional development for faculty, students to be able to learn the most relevant um, information required for them to get uh, job ready and uh, to be able to apply themselves to the current career needs and be able to grow in and have a career path in, in the, the field of their choice. Um, with this, I, um, I wanna say that when I went to school, I had no idea I would be doing this. I, have, I, I did not even, I, I, if I go back 20 years, 30 years, I would have never guessed that this is what I do as, um, as my day-to-day -day job. Um, uh, but to do this, a lot of things, experience of my previous life actually prepared me for this. And I'll just briefly go over what, uh, what are my, the different hats I wore over my, um, uh, I guess, employment life. Um, I started right off college. I started as a QA, QC trainee at SmithKline Beecham. This was before SmithKline was SmithKline Glaxo. Um, they hadn't been merged yet. And I was in the QA, QC department. And um, here's where you are better off than I ever was because you actually know what QA and QC mean and I did not. Um, when I went on the job, I learned that QC was actually the quality management and fulfilling quality requirements. And QA was the process. I had no idea what that meant until I was on the job and I was given chunks of books to read and I had promised myself, I'm not going to read a lot. I'm just going to go work. But I realized that it's so important to know what these terms mean and how they are applicable to the job. And very quickly, I realized that my reports soon were going to be stamped into products that were going to be put out for consumers and uh, companies or pharmaceuticals to take. And all of a sudden, I realized that everything I learned was very important. Um, a, little, a little bit later, after my training period, I ended up managing a part of the water system for the plant uh, that I worked at. And um, I had to go in and look for uh, the latest quality um, of um, UV bulbs. I had to go back to my high school books to learn about the, the, a bit of physics and math that I thought I'll never look at again because I needed to know what UV, what wavelength meant, what kind of um, impact it has on the water quality and what cleaning meant, what detergents to use or what kind of um, cleaning processes were available that were approved to be used in a consumable plant in a pharmaceutical plant, which means it, I had to hit the books again and look at the fine details. And I very quickly realized that I had actually learned of all of this in school, in, in my cl college classes, but I hadn't paid attention. And I had to just go back to them again. Um, a few years later, 
um, I um, ended up joining a, a company where um, we detected multi-analytes. So um, this was detecting different carbohydrates and different lipids all on the same platform. So for instance, you know, when you give your blood sample and they check if you have antibodies for multiple, dif multiple uh, diseases, right? Or that you, that you are actually immune and a titer, or, for, or if you're looking for the blood components, what are the different ones? And if it's all done on one platform. So I learned how to use my um, enzyme knowledge and pipetting skills, a whole lot of things that I didn't think I would use. And very quickly, a lot of the things I had learned in school became very relevant. And um, also with that, I realized that I needed to keep my resume updated because I needed to know what I knew and what I didn't. And I had to be truthful to myself and go back and get refresher courses. I did that a lot, probably something once every couple of years at least. Although I already had a job, I needed to keep myself relevant. And some of these, um, the community colleges actually are so amazing in this aspect because we already ha always have continuing education and using them um, will be so helpful in your careers to keep yourself updated and relevant all along. Um, this is something that um, I did further on in life before I joined Austin Community College. I was a biomanufacturing supervisor for a therapeutic antibody company. Now in this company, um, they have a, a thousand liter bags um, where they, uh, what they, what we did was um, grow cells, monitor them, um, and these cells were uh, designed or engineered to produce anti-IL-6 antibodies, which it got me very excited when COVID started. I know it feels, sounds really strange to say that, but it's almost like everybody was now understanding what I did at work because these were the antibodies, um, anti-inflammatory antibodies that I helped um, manufacture and produce. And this was sent out for, um, uh, back then when I did it for um, anti or therapeutic treatment for arthritis or cancer and other inflammatory um, recovery programs. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And um, what I wanna say is, uh, I'll go back to my very early story back in middle school when I wanted to be a doctor, right? 50% of us wanna be a doctor. And then I came to high school and I have to thank my cousin or not. She was studying medicine and I saw how much she studied all the time. And I told myself, I can't do this for the next 10 years. This is not gonna happen. No, this is not it, not for me. And very quickly, I realized that I still love life sciences. And I followed that path and got my bachelor's and master's in um, microbiology, botany, and biochemistry. But what I realize is the more you learn, the more you will realize that you have more to learn. And books are our best friend. And having a, a, a knowledge or seeking knowledge just to understand what am I doing? What, um, what do I know and how can I utilize that? Who can I talk to? to understand more about what I want to do and how do I need to equip myself better for it is a fantastic way to have a really solid career trajectory for yourself. Um, and with that, um, I thought I won't read a lot, but I won't write a lot, but I'm doing all of that now and with, a, with pleasure because I really understand what I'm doing. And when you, when you know what you're doing, you start enjoying every bit of work that you do. Um, and today I'm so happy um, uh, with what I do because I know um, I learn every day and I help others like me and uh, the future uh, workforce. Um, I'm helping them as well. And, um, and I'm so thankful that so many of you are on, on the same path and I can see all of you uh, with successful careers in the coming future. So with that, um, if you have any questions for me, Please let me know.
Thank you very much. I actually wrote down a few of your statements because we've been seeing some themes come through from our speakers. Um, one theme is understanding how to learn so you know what you need to learn. And then documentation, documentation, documentation. But I really like that you talked a lot about how um, you learned on the job, even though there were expectations of what you should know. So you knew that you had to go home and do some reviewing, some studying and seek out support that they may initially think you should already know. So fake it till you make it, I guess. But no, I mean, I appreciate it. It's nice to hear it from people that are in the industry and actively working. So students understand the processes and, you know, timelines. Absolutely. Um, in fact, one thing, uh, and I say this to my students all the time, uh, now that I uh, do teach, and I tell them, you know, when I say this to you, I know you're hearing me, but you're really not hearing me because you're not ready to hear it. But listen to it anyway, because I promise you, you'll use it somewhere at some time, because anything you hear, anything you learn will never go waste. I, I can vouch for that personally a thousand times that anything we hear is always going to come back and help us out somewhere. Um, I really believe that. Um, yeah, documentation. Um, documentation and uh, actually a backup for the documentation. That's really, really important. Um, if you have um, anything that you found or something you want to try, where did you get that information from? Just put a little link there or just put a, a book name, a, a page number, something because God knows, six months from now you go, I think I did something. And when you go look for it, it's gone. You don't know, you don't even know where you found it. And it's probably something that's going to be leading you on to something that's really important. So just have documentation and have backup evidence that you actually did the work because we all do the work. We just need to make sure we have it solid. I'm just so happy you're stating all this. This is stuff that as a uh, program, we discuss amongst each other a lot and how to emphasize the importance and improve the skill sets. So I definitely appreciate you bringing up those points. And we did not coach Pornima for those points. Oh. These themes are coming up on their own. No, no, I think it's the first time I'm talking to you in quite a few, um, probably a year or so. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, in a while. Yeah, I, I just saw, um, um, I saw, I see a couple of uh, uh, messages, comments in the um, chat. So I just put my email down and I um, encourage anybody if you want to um, just talk with me or email me about anything, I'm always open. It would be a pleasure to talk to you and answer any questions you have um, about this. And yeah, uh, Charlene, I see that you put the, um, the incubator. Um, oh, it's amazing. I was going to say, if, if anyone's in Austin, y'all should try to see it because it's unbelievable what you guys have going on over there. So absolutely. In fact, um, and you know what, if you're in town, just uh, just ping me, uh, email me and I'll take you on a tour. Um, the 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 best part about that is our college bought the the mall that was kind of withering away and they put um, they put in, um, a, a, we, we, we're actually, I think, on Sears or a part of Dillard's or something. Um, and we ended up designing um, a lab for startup companies. And we have, I might be not, I'm not, I might not be current right now. We probably, uh, the last time I checked, we had about 17 companies in there with 11 in wait list. Um, so these are companies that get a start. And we put latest um, equipment. And all that's all thanks to grant. So um, I never learned grant writing in school, but it's actually a process. If you just take a class, just understand what that means. There's a deliverable and you're saying, I want to propose that I want to meet that deliverable. That's really the one sentence for a grant. And, um, and, and, and when we don't have something, there is so much support out there that all you have to do is Find, the, find people to talk to, get yourself on that path, have a vision and then follow your dream and it'll happen. That's, that's, that's pretty much what I wanna say about anything. 
Well, we definitely appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to our students and our faculty and staff. We really appreciate it. And um, Pranima is serious that if you're in Austin, just to email her, that's what Charlie did. Charlie was in Austin one time. She emailed Pranima, they met up and then Charlie got a tour of the facilities. So don't hesitate. It's one big family. The biotech chem chemical tech world is one big family within the US. So everyone tries to support everyone. Absolutely. You said it 100% right, Amanda. Thank you so, so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. You take care. And I am going to hand this over to Ms. Shunik. So I would love to introduce y'all to our next speaker, Dr. Pam Marshall. She was very influential in my ability to start doing forensic science at Delgado. And at the time she was overseeing the forensic program at SUNO and has since moved on to Duquesne University. So uh, she shared many stories with me that I have shared with my students to emphasize uh, packaging things in proper containers and approaching forensic science very carefully. And um, she's here to talk about all of her experience and, you know, bring forensic science back into biotech because it is all about lab skills and lab technology. So without any more to say, here's Dr. Marshall. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you, Amanda. Um, can I share my screen? Or do you have my slides? Nope, you can okay. share it. You have control. Okay. Perfect. I like having control. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for the invitation today. And um, I hope I can be as well spoken as um, your previous uh, guest, who I was able to kind of join and, and watch her speak about. Um, her life and what led her on her path. And I'm gonna share a little bit about my story today. Um, I named this talk, Every Contact Leaves a Trace. Uh, this is the foundation of forensic science um, that every single time a person comes into um, uh, contact with an object, with a crime scene, they're leaving some of themselves behind and they're taking something with them. But I titled my talk this way because I think it's also important to look at it from a life standpoint. Every person you come into contact with is going to help form you. It's going to help uh, leave a trace on you to determine what your path may be. And um, you get one ride on this planet. So whatever you choose to do in life, you wanna make sure that you love to do it. And I hope that that comes across in this presentation today. So a little bit about my story. I also started out pre-med. I knew uh, from a very early age, I, I loved medicine, I loved children. And so I was going to do a mix of the two and become a pediatrician. Um, I get, got my Bachelor of Science in Biology from Texas Christian University in case my Southern accent has not given me away yet. And um, I literally was two years in had already taken my MCATs. Um, my parents had spent an obscene amount of money on that MCAT prep course for me when this case happened um, on June 12, 1994. And it, it seems old hat now that we, we have court TV, we see all of these criminal trials almost 24 seven. We have podcasts, we have every version of CSI in every city in America um, right on your cable TV. But in the 90s, there were not these TV shows. There was nothing really to give you this exposure um, to true forensic science. So this OJ case was literally the first court case in my lifetime where you could see the entire process from start to finish. Um, again, I'm going to date myself, but this is before you had DVRs. This was the age of a VHS tape that had somewhere between six and eight hours of video time on it. So I literally raced home between my college classes every single day, uh, watched a world-renowned forensic scientist, Dr. Henry Lee, talk about blood on socks, and it totally changed my career trajectory. 
So again, this was before these programs existed like the one at Duquesne. I'm sorry, Charlene, I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct your pronunciation of my school, but it's a Northeastern thing, so you're forgiven. Um, so there was no CSI, there were no forensic science program. Today, um, you're blessed with forensic science programs across the country and even forensic science courses begin in high school. Um, so you can have that exposure fairly early. But what I did was I met with a, um, an examiner, a forensic examiner at my local uh, medical examiner's office. I am still friends with him to this day. And he said, look, they're just looking for a hard science degree. Get your master's in any kind of hard science, and then you can work at a crime lab and, and do this type of work. So I ultimately ended up at a school in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, called the University of North Texas Health Science Center, where I was pursuing my master's in biochemistry when that uh, they actually created a program in forensic genetics. So I, I piggybacked two master's degrees and was able to walk out of there in 2002 uh, with a second master's specifically in forensic genetics. And if you think about where we were as a country, we had the events of 9-11 in 2001. So this really spurred a lot of forensic education programs across the country. And we truly knew that we had this need for better homeland security, more forensic scientists across the country. And of course, that all starts with training the next generation. So I was part of the next generation in 2002. Today, I train the next generation of forensic scientists. I ultimately went back to UNT and gained my PhD in, again, specifically in DNA, uh, touch DNA, uh, forensic science identification. What can you do with a forensic science degree? There are so many things. So there's about 140 crime labs across the country. No, I'm sorry. There's 140 forensic education programs across the country. There's over 400 crime labs across the country. So you can become an analyst. You can work public, government, your local crime labs. Um, Quest Diagnostics does forensic testing. Um, Cigna, which is now New York Life, does forensic investigations. You can be a teacher. Uh, you can do research. So we still need research. We need, we need those students who want to stay at a bench, who want to get their PhD to advance the research, because the technology is always continuing to improve. And we need people to know how that technology works, number one, but also how it can work to advance our field of knowledge to maybe be able to get a better DNA profile or a better comparison of a fingerprint than the tools that we have today. I, I was always waiting uh, for that call to say, hey, do you want to be a technical advisor on a TV show? So I have had my 15 minutes of fame. Um, for those of you who want to look this up, it's, it was a great program called Reasonable Doubt. I believe it's now in season four. Um, but the premise of this show is that family members reach out because they believe their loved ones have been wrongfully imprisoned. And so one of the hosts of this show is a detective and the other host is a, um, a legal analyst or a lawyer. And so they kind of divide the work and conquer and determine whether or not that person um, should be behind bars or whether more work is needed. This was the, the lab set up at Southern University in New Orleans. It's a wonderful lab. It's a wonderful program that's still there. Um, but there's my 15 minutes. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I also had the opportunity to be on Nancy Grace um, Court TV. I kind of felt like I had come full circle because remember, that's where my story started. I was watching Court TV and watching the OJ case happen. In terms of my work history, um, I, I have been a bench analyst for about five years. So I've worked about uh, 1,400 cases for, from a forensic standpoint. Um, I've testified only about 20 times. Typically when there's DNA um, evidence, they, they take plea. Uh, so there, there's really nothing there for, for testimony experience. And then um, I've also, uh, one of the great uh, things that I've done in my life was the ability to travel to Africa uh, to help set up a DNA lab in Angola. 
Um, and to this day, I still continue to do casework consultancy. I still testify on cases. Um, wrongful convictions are still the cases that are near and dear to my heart um, to make sure that we find the persons uh, properly responsible for those types of crimes. And then since I got my PhD, I have been uh, in an academic setting, running first the program in New Orleans and now here in Pittsburgh. I always want to share this because when I'm sitting on a plane and people find out what I do for a living, they're always like, wow, what is, what is that like? Is it like what you see on TV? And so I always want to give students a true perspective of what this looks like. Uh, this was the Maryland State Police Forensic Science Division. It's a beautiful lab and it's a full service lab. Uh, we used to joke, you guys were talking about documentation earlier, that MSP stood for must shuffle paper um, because the documentation is so intense uh, for crimes and um, crime scene analysis. So they are full service. They train their own crime scene personnel. Um, they have people just solely responsible for coordinating the evidence and where it moves throughout a laboratory. Who's on a chain of custody will dictate who goes into court and testifies as to where that evidence was at a certain time. Uh, chemistry unit trace, which is hair, uh, arson, fibers, uh, sometimes tool mark impressions, biology, which is kind of where I lived, firearms, latent prints, question documents. These are things like ransom letters, fraudulent notes. If you purchase a, a Babe Ruth baseball, signed baseball on eBay, you want to make sure it's Babe Ruth's signature. Um, and then photography. So we all know we take photos to um, give us a permanent idea of where we were at a certain time, who we were with, what we looked like, if we were having a good hair day. That's the same way we use photography for forensics. We want to make sure we have a permanent documentation of where the evidence was located and what that evidence looked like at that specific time on that specific day. So we handled about 450 cases a year. Um, most are the sexual assaults and homicides. Forensic science is not for the faint of heart. We literally deal with the worst thing that one human being can do to another. Um, and so we have to treat it as such. The typical job duties, we received evidence. Um, again, maintaining chain of custody. Analyze, I would analyze cases for blood and other body fluids. I would generate my report of the results. And then if needed, I would testify. It's always important too that I get to sleep at night because the guilt of a person is never in my hands. I'm only going to testify as to what my results of that evidence were in my testing. Uh, the jury in the cases decides the guilt or innocence. And so that's how I'm able to sleep at night that I don't have that burden um, on my shoulders every day. I did want to share a couple of cases that I've worked. Um, when I hear about police involved uh, deaths, it doesn't necessarily um, surprise me. I, I worked a horrible um, police involved homicide investigation in 2005 in Baltimore. This is a picture of Raymond Smoot. Um, by society standards, probably not a great guy because he was in the Baltimore County Detention Center um, serving time for a crime that he had committed. But I will tell you that it is no one's right to take his life. Um, and so we have to be very careful about the information that comes across in media about what these people, um, what their backgrounds were that would potentially say, hey, it's okay that this person is now deceased. That is never okay. Um, this man was beaten, stomped, and kicked to death by dozens of guards within his cell. And it took about a month for eight guards to finally be fired for um, their activities that evening. I will tell you, I do have a graphic photo, so um, I apologize. Um, but he actually did uh, live and he was on life support. Um, but we're talking about, you know, people who wear 4XL clothing with steel enforced boots. Um, this is what this man looked like, and this is the death that they chose for him. Uh, ultimately, I was on the stand for eight hours this day. Three correctional officers were charged, and um, one of the three was convicted uh, for second-degree murder. The city of Baltimore paid about a half a million dollar settlement, but that money will never bring 
uh, Mr. Raymond Smoot back. And these are the pictures from 2005. And if you look at them, they look similar to pictures that we still see today um, from unarmed uh, black men being killed in the streets by police officers, um, by people being killed um, for no valid reason. And so this is why I continue to tell my students to be the policy changers. If you want change, you can change the policy. We also worked a lot of sexual assaults and I don't normally provide the victim's name, but this was a cold case I worked. This was a woman who was raped in 1988. I was still in middle school. Um, so this was not anything that I even thought about doing when this woman was victimized. Um, but she actually wrote a book with the detective who worked her case, Detective Cordell, um, and I was able to help assist um, with this investigation. And I talked a little bit about research. So I wanted to end today with just a few areas that I'm very, very passionate about. One is wildlife um, uh, crime is also um, very much at the forensic forefront. There is more money involved in ivory trafficking than gold. Um, and so it's very important that if we still want these large mammals in existence across our globe, that we have to start fighting wildlife trafficking. We also have a number of projects here in Pittsburgh. We have a lot of ancient human remain projects, um, looking at touch DNA projects, strangulation devices, how to get DNA from those devices. Um, in a couple of weeks, I have students uh, finishing their projects on hyoid fracture analysis and ghost guns. So we have a lot of different projects going on here. Um, we're also very interested in how to improve collection and packaging um, and the ideas and projects just continue. And I'll just leave you with one of my absolutely favorite quotes. Um, all of you on this in this audience today have people who believe in you, but if you do not believe in yourself, then it's going to be a very hard journey for you. So you wouldn't be where you are, you wouldn't be in attendance today if you didn't have the tools that you need to succeed. And so please believe in yourself. You're capable of doing absolutely great things. Um, I do have my information. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Charlene, feel free to share all of this. My students always have my cell, so I'm fine giving my cell number away. Um, but please share that information if needed. And then I'm gonna stop share. I think maybe I have a couple of minutes here for questions if anyone wants to ask me anything. Um, I actually do, Dr. Marshall. Um, it's Amanda Rosenzweig. And maybe, I don't remember the years, but was it 10 years ago that Michael Vicks, um, the, the book was written about his dogs and one or two of the chapters was dedicated to like animal forensics where this woman specifically was looking at the remains of the dogs buried. And is that similar to the same thing that's being done with like body forensics for humans? Absolutely, yeah, they, they do so much. They can tell if animals have been hoarded. They can tell if animals have been starved prior to death based on the um, any markings in the bone. Um, they can do protein identification to see if the animals have been mistreated prior to death. Um, so yes, the, the animal um, forensics has come quite a long way. Um, sadly, though, it's used almost in, in other countries more than it's used here, although we have had some high profile cases here solved um, by the use of animal forensics. Thank you. Thanks. Now that um, animal abuse is going to be a federal offense, the same, aren't we going to treat it similarly to, um, to human murder? I, I think, you know, we obviously, it's, it's part of the triad for serial killers. And so it's also important to look at it from that perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the penalties are there yet. I mean, we look at different penalties for killing a human that aren't even where they should be. Um, and so it, it would be very interesting if someone got a, a higher sentence for killing an animal versus someone who kills a human. And so there's a lot of political debate 
around these topics. Um, you know, the UK doesn't have gun violence like we do, but they, they train their dogs to kill um, because they can't get their hands on firearms. So every country has some slightly different issues. Um, I will not get on my soapbox about gun control um, here today, but, but that's another hot topic. Well, I know I'm right at time and I don't want to take away from the next presenter. So thank you again. And I do have to step off for my students today, but thank you again, Charlie and Amanda thank you. for allowing thank me you. to be here today. Thank you so, so much. Have a great day and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. So Charlie, are you seeing my canvas or the welcome to SLT house? The welcome to SLT. Okay. Sorry, I have I have multiple screens and sometimes I can't figure out which one it's um, mirroring. I was just going to mention to people, um, the kind of playing off of Dr. Marshall's speech or talk, if you haven't looked into the Innocence Project, some of the things she was talking about, that's what they do. And they do it with cold case DNA evidence. New Orleans actually has the second largest chapter. Uh, it was started, I believe, here in 2005 or four. And uh, we've been exonerating quite a few people over the pandemic, like more than we have over the last decade or so. So there is a group that helps get people that are innocent out of prison. It just takes a really long time. But I'll type it into the chat box if you haven't heard of it. It is a great organization. I was fortunate enough to attend one of their fundraisers. And for their speakers, they actually brought in people that they helped exonerate. So it's... Um, it definitely makes you think twice about how important biotechnology, chemical technology, forensics, documentation, and evidence is. You hear I threw that word documentation in there again? So our final speaker um, had to um, go to an emergency meeting, so they were unable to attend, but they did send us um, short videos just to kind of go over career path and opportunities. We're not going to play them for y'all, but we will share them with you when we send out information from the speakers, as well as the um, open house uh, presentation. And um, as soon as this four hour video encodes and loads to Zoom, Charlie's going to send it to me to edit and then we'll have that posted. So our goal is tomorrow to have all this sent to y'all um, so you can have it for referencing and to go back through it um, for any information that you may want to circle back to for job opportunities, career advice, or mentorships. Any lasting words, Charlie, April, or Deandra? Thank you all so much for attending and participating. Um, we really appreciate it. And we do do this for our students. And we just want them to see that whatever we're doing right now does not really determine where we're gonna end up in the future. And sometimes what might look like one closed door really will open so many other doors for you. So um, hopefully everyone's sort of seen that through all these journeys that our friends and supporters have told us about today. So, um, you know, we are here to support y'all. We care about you guys very much. And we know that you will be successful in whatever y'all choose to do. And hopefully you can see you know, that um, sometimes where we set out to go is not where we end up, but that doesn't mean, mean it's bad, it's just different. So I think today's been very interesting and educational. And again, thank y'all so much for coming. Just to reiterate the same thing, thank you. We appreciate all of you guys for coming, the speakers and all of the students. Um, and then um, those that are in the program, your teachers will, or instructors will give you a special gift um, just to say thank you guys for coming and we appreciate you all being in the program. If there are no further questions or any interest that y'all wanna bring up, we can thank you one more time for coming and let you have the rest of your day back to go enjoy and document. We're not going to lose documentation now. That is a theme. Thank you. 
Beatrice, we appreciate you showing up. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, 